This is the Doctor Who Alhambra podcast, episode 116, originally recorded December 1st, 2019. In this podcast, we are going to be covering many topics, uh, big finish, news, new Doctor Who series, as well as the Revelations of Dalek book series. This is late in recording because... We've just had busy, busy lives. <laughs> exactly. Yes. How's the weather where you are in uh, now, Liam? Freezing. Yes. <laughs> Freezing? Very cold. How about you, Humphrey? Freezing. How about you? Well, as we're in the same uh, town, <laughs> it's freezing here, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're literally uh, probably... Uh, yeah, we, we, it's yeah, same weather where we both are. <laughs> well, we're about what? 500? Well, as the crow flies, probably about 500, yeah, 500 yards. Yes. Is what you've said? Yeah, about away that. Away from each other. Basically, if you look out my window, you, you can technically see, uh, see Humphrey's flat. So. Ah. And vice versa. So how far in distance would it take for the three-eyed raven to get there? Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> a minute. Probably, or less. <laughs> or less, yeah. Well, like, like it was said, this is episode 116. We have a lot of catching up to do because it's been forever and a half. And I will say, looking forward to the next episode that we record, we are going to do... We won't get most of December's Big Finish reviews in, but what I will say is we will get a... 11 out of 12 month year end review also composing of all the releases for the month of November which I, I I don't know I don't know what I've been doing lately but I have had literally no time for big finish which yes. I I just barely I just barely finished the uh two-parter Cyberman story yeah. and I I almost want to quickly talk about that before we move on just because it's just so fresh in my mind and mm. i have well, a, actually... i have a what sorry carry on no what were you gonna say i was gonna say that's actually quite good because there's there's some bits i'm i'm a bit hazy and foggy on so if you can clear Me that too. up then that would be kind of handy so here's my question so uh, actually not my question more or less my theory regarding the two-parter and mm. Annoyingly, just like uh, the previous two-parter, which we will review when we get to the month of October, the first part was just amazing. I mean, it was like The Running Man, except in Doctor Who world, and it, uh, it with kind of like Cybermen-ish technology. And then the mm. second part, which I thought was going to be even better than the first part, I felt as though it fell flat on its face. Yeah, a little bit, but, yeah. Yeah, a bit. It took, well, at the end, anyway. Uh, and, yes. And I, I, I was like, come on, when are we going to see the Cybermen? And they, they hardly featured, and it's like, ah. Oh, I mean, I love oh. that they brought up or took us to kind of a telos type of a, a setting, a yeah. kind of hive or, you know, tomb-ish type of a thing where they're all just on standby mode. I well, appreciate it's, it's pretty, that. It's pretty much a, it, it was pretty much a, a, to, a, tomb world, a tomb world, wasn't it? Like, yeah. Hmm. yeah. I think, And I appreciate... No, continue, Henry. I, I think conversion should have been a four-parter. I agree. You know, it's an interesting mm. concept, but it was just done in too short a time, so they weren't able to do the story properly. No, and I didn't really like the whole subplot with that annoying... Gun runner, techie person, people. See, I was couple, fine with that, but the like octopus doctor person or whatever, I did oh. not care for. Yeah, yeah, that too. I was just like, really, I, 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 I understand we're alien species and they will sound differently or whatever, but the, the way in which this, it, maybe if the voice actress kind of could have done something a little bit different. I would have enjoyed it a little bit better, but I just, every single time, like when she died, I, I'm really not teasing. I, I don't feel as though that's a big, like, like plot hole mm. right there that she died. But I will tell you when she died, I was just like, yes, I will no longer have to listen to her. <laughs> yeah. Um. So he here's my question about, about, um, inst not, not, not interstitial, uh, war zone and conversion or conversion mainly. 
So what happened at the end? Is is Mark a Cyberman, but but you know converted to a so, degree, but still human? I'm I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that you said that because that's where I I really wanted to talk about that, and I don't don't think I could wait until we did our recording. I believe uh, are we set up for <laughs> December fourteenth? I know. I that, believe uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, I don't um, think. Uh, speaking of which, I may have someone joining us to do a segment on the Prisoner, uh, Volume Ooh. Three, because um, uh, Kyle actually listened to. Well, I actually we actually went through and we listened to all three volumes, and um, it would be interesting to get his take on what you know his theories of the Prisoner and what he thinks actually. Oh, I'm so, down with that. So, um, so yeah. So here's my theory regarding. The how it ended, and I again, I don't feel as though that this is some big old uh, spoiler or whatever. I feel as though if you've listened to it or if you have not listened to it, at the very end, I and I will say teasing the previous one, the oh, well, the one where we were introduced to Mark. I can't think of the story. Um, the Cicero one. Yeah. 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 Tartarus. T- Tartarus. At the very end of Tartarus. The doctor approaches Cicero as he's writing his normal letter that he did during the whole Big Finish Originals Cicero thing. And the doctor comes in and... Hello, Cicero. What are you doing here? Had a feeling you might be writing a letter. Oh, this. (laughs) And I suppose you're worried I might send it and that it might be preserved for posterity. Something like that. I don't send all of these letters, you know. Often I write them just to clear my thoughts. And the contents of this one... Well, one would have to be barking mad to send a letter like this. I suppose. Once finished, I shall read it once, from beginning to end, and then I shall consign it to the flames. That's a relief. (laughs) And how is Mark? Oh, Mark is... uh, He's doing splendidly, enjoying his travels. That's a lie, isn't it? Please don't tell me I released him into your care only for something terrible to happen. Travelling... With me can be... Dangerous, yes. And lethal? I should go. And I feel as though that took place at the very end of conversion. Because he yeah. basically... Mm. he's the, the, the And what I, I do appreciate, though, is it's allowing Tegan and Mark and Nyssa some time away from the Doctor. And it gives... Big finish time to play around with the doctor being the fifth doctor being solo. He doesn't mm. have to, you know, be like, oh, just one second, Tegan. And then suddenly, you know, the, the the TARDIS engine goes and he's just like, oh, he accidentally left her behind. And then, oh, well, don't worry. I'll just kind of pop right back and she'll never even know that I was gone for one second, even though this adventure lasted, you know, three weeks or something like that. I, yeah. I, I like yeah. that Big Finish gave themselves time to play. Mm. But you know, I I I I hope that gets you know that that this thread gets carried on in next year because I, I I think so because the only way that I think they would ever not do that is if they did another Tegan, uh, Nissa, and Adric story. That would be mm. the only way that they have this storyline on hold. Mm. Well, that wouldn't necessarily well, like be a bad the... thing. If they did that, no, I mean it's better. But then again, it's like the Sixth Doctor. <coughs> Constance and Flip storyline, you know that that's been been on hold for ages. Luckily, they are doing more of Constance and Flip. I just like what Lisa Greenwood calls Nick Briggs, Dalek face. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that just cracks me up. So, but um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think Mark. I, I think there is some cyber conversion, but I don't think to me. Away. I, uh, not only do I not think it's all the way, because remember, he was supposed to be in the Cybermen were excited because he could infiltrate them because mm. he still looks like us. He just has like like that cybernetic bone that was kind of enhanced in Warzone. A and bit like kind of um, Josh in. Um, yes, in just kind of exactly. And I and I think the main reason why the doctor kind of came back to Cicero is basically, for in all tense purposes, he is dead to Cicero because there's no way you can yeah, uh, no Viking can funeral or whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, you, you could you could Viking funeral him or whatever, but you know, if if he did come back, the, the doctor would have to wait for you know that corpse and then basically become a body snatcher and snatch it so that uh, it couldn't be found. Pretty much. Mm. And even then, Tisha would be like, you know, what the hell? Like, that's not Mark, you know. Exactly. So, mm. However, he'd be really helpful around the house, though. I mean, you know, having like two hundred percent strength. Oh, oh. <laughs> hey, hey, Mark, could you like lift that boulder over there? Uh, oh, oh, sure. Oh, oh. This thing. Open that, you know, open that Wait, pickle jar. No, no, not, yeah, not, sure. not the mountain, the boulder. Ah. <laughs> 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 uh, uh. But no, I, I, it was a shame because I really wanted to see more of the eighty Cybermen because they, they are they are probably uh, next to the the tenth planet ones. They're probably my favorite mm. versions. Yeah, I'd agree. Of them. <clears throat> so um, it was just a shame we didn't see more of them, really. So I guess we'll have to wait on giving our whole uh, rating because we didn't actually mm. officially <laughs> um, do it. Yeah. review. We just gave our thoughts and discussion regarding Warzone and conversion. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, we'll get to the Doctor Who news that has happened. And as of, I believe, it was the 18th of November... Uh, BBC Books had a online uh, Terence Dix World Cup of books to commemorate and to, to find find what books the fans wanted and put all those target books into one single hardbound volume. Oh, and it was oh yeah. Mm. So what they did is on Twitter they put. All of sixty-four, uh, all of Terence Dix's sixty-four novels, and put them into gr- sixteen groups of four of them at a time. And w- with within each group, the two highest ones would move on to the next round, which I thought was odd, but I also kind of liked it at the same time mm. because. <clears throat> and, I'll, uh, and I I also love what they did with some of the groupings because some of the groupings I was near the very end. It was just like they just kind of put a whole bunch of them in, but. I want you to listen. To, so this is Group B. I like Group B. Planet of the Spiders, Planet of the Daleks, the Planet of Evil, and Planet of the Giants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Huh. I, 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 and then Group C, Destiny of the Daleks, Day of the Daleks, Gen- Genesis of the Daleks, and Death to the Daleks. Hmm. I see. Yes. So out of all 64, and I'll tell you, some of them, I was just, I was really bummed that a couple of them won. I was like, oh, come on, man. And uh, uh, what was it? So, oh, I want to go down to group F because I liked where they were going with group F. And then, uh, and then I, they sadly had to just throw in a third one. Mm. So they had group F, the three doctors, the five doctors, four to doomsday and the keeper of Traken. Hmm. And I, I found that a shame because I feel, and I have not read any of these, m- most of these books. I have listened to the first portion of the five doctors, and I have started reading the th- the three doctors. But I feel as though it's, I don't know how well Keeper of Traken is. I know it's a great story on the classic, but. The book's not been out in audio yet, so I don't know what it's like. Oh, um, four to doomsday, I know is not good. And so I feel as though the four, the five doctors and the three doctors easily trounced both of those. And they did. So. So which ones made it to the final? So you know, what's, what's the final rundown then? So the final rundown is the five doctors, the invasion, uh, the Auton invasion, the Genesis of the Daleks, the abominable snowmen. The Wheel in Space, the Dalek Invasion of Earth, the Pyramids of Mars, the Horror of Fang Rock, the Towns of Winshying, and Day of the Daleks. Yeah, hmm. I can see I can see why fans would have chosen those. So I have a question, and uh, uh, here, and I'm glad that you're here, Humphrey, because I have read The Abominable Snowman and The Web of Fear, and I feel as though, even though I, I and it's been a while since I listened to both of the audio, or the, the remains of the audio of Abdominal Snowman, just because I don't want to hear Victoria just scream for half of an episode. <laughs> but I feel as though the stronger story in both print, in, in book, and also 
on the television is, is the web, web of, of fear. fear. Yeah. Do you what, do you see why somebody would vote or fans would vote Abominable Snowman over Web of Fear? Web of Fear is good in that you know obviously we've got the Brigadier coming into it and um, it is a strong Yeti story. Yeah, but the Abominable Snowman, I think, is a more interesting story in that you know. Um, a, a, a Web of Fear is a strong story for sure. It's a very good story, but it's it, it's not that different in many ways to a lot of the, you know, John Pertwee episodes. Uh, you know, your typical alien invasion, blah 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 blah. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a criticism, but it's you know what people are used to. Whereas the Abominable Snowman. For one thing, it's set in Tibet, which is not somewhere you would typically think of having a Doctor Who story. The invasion of the intelligence is done in a very interesting manner in that story, in that it uses the Buddhist monks and and that sort of thing. So they're both excellent stories, but I think as a fan, for me personally... The Abominable Snowman is a more interesting story. It's a more imaginative story. It's, you know, it's it's, it's a bit outside the box. I think. Okay, uh, I I'm having again. I feel as though my, I'm swayed one way, but I love your your deep and thorough knowledge of these books. So I I, I will bow to your greatness when it comes to that. <laughs> so, um. Here's a question for you, because um, I'm not sure all the one the uh, Cyberman stories that he did. I bo- I'm only counting two, which is the Revenge of the Cybermen and the Wheel in Space. And the Wheel in Space, I, I I have not bought in that book. I have not listened to it because it is really hard to get a copy of, because mm-hmm. I think they maybe either either limited it or it was n- near the ones where Target was going out of business and they didn't print as many of them so uh, coming across a good copy of it is rare it is so, available on, on audio that one not the novel oh it? not the novel no the hmm. soundtrack is but not the novel oh um, yeah the soundtrack I thought, I thought the oh, William, yeah. oh okay i thought the wooden space had been done on, on audio. I, I think it's going okay. to be done oh right because okay. i i was just curious why and i uh, have you listened to revenge of the cybermen at all not it's novel. not out on audio, is it? It's not out on audio. Oh, it's yet. not. No. Okay. No. Because I was gonna. I was curious how well that story is in comparison to yeah. its actual <laughs> TV. Sorry. TV. Uh huh. Well, the concept is good, so I, it's just the execution. I wonder of the if. Team. I wonder if the uh, if they'll do the if they'll do the weird sort of South African approach to Cybermen. Probably not if Briggs <laughs> is doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know what? When it comes to continuity like that, let's just forget about it. <laughs> um, so I got a question. So I, I want one more question, and then I want to actually pose another question regarding Terrence Dix and stuff like that, because something came across Twitter that I was not a fan of, hmm. and that re- revolves around the horror of Fang Rock. I, to me, I've never really been a huge fan of this story. There is a, an interesting mystery regarding a lighthouse around the Scotland area where something similar happened to this around the same time that this is supposed to have happened. So I like that this is kind of similarly to something, a historic event that happened. Mm. But at the same time, I just feel as though, I, at least visually on the classic story of Horror of Fang Rock, I did not particularly enjoy it. What are your feelings regarding the audio version of that? Very good. Um, it's been ages since I've I've listened to Horror Fang Rock, so I I, I can't can't really give a comment because it's been that long since I've, I've listened to Baker. Um, well, the the TV version is good, but the audio is even better. The novel, it's mm. it's even better, you know, because there's more expansion on certain things. And, no, I, which I, I'm really looking forward to. Sorry, I'm really looking forward to getting into when we do our book review of Revelation of the Daleks because 
I think there's some positive expansion, and I believe there's some expansion that was unnecessary. Yeah. But w- w- do you remember what they kind of expanded on in Horn Fang Rock at all? Uh, or? It's a Terrence Dix novel, so it's not expanded massively, but just certain things. It's, it's hard to remember because it's a long time since I read it, but um, certain things just made a little bit more sense. And, you know, you're like, oh, that's why that's happened. And, you know, it's things like that. that things were just explained a little bit more, really. Actually, so okay. So, with that being said, one of the things that annoyed me is around the same time that it was announced that Terrence Dix had passed away, Big Finish posed a question on Twitter asking, So, should we bring back the uh, and now I forgot, um, the Rutan. who is the villain? Yeah, the R- Rutans. And I was like, the Rutans, what? Yeah, you should. Well, no, but I mean, the day or the day after he passes away, that's what, like, uh, and and here's my annoyance regarding this whole thing. When you went to Hooverville a couple of years ago, you asked Terrence Dix this, hey, would you, like, would you be interested in doing a uh, Terrence Dix present similar to the Philip Hinchcliffe? And and he, you know, laughed it off as, yeah, sure, as long as they give me money for it, I I don't care. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what? I, I don't mind that because... But what I do mind is now he's passed away. Let's see if we can like cash in on this thing. Whereas we're how willing were we to do a Rutan story before he died? They did. They did and to me, that's fear. yeah. They did do Castle of Fear, but I believe that's like uh, main range one twenty six or something like that. Something like that. So. Y- it's yes, been it a while. Plus, all right, I th- rock. I know. Plus, also the last time. <laughs> <laughs> no, c- hang you on. know. No, sorry, th- be be a on, little bit on. more excited. Hang on, no, sir. I think you're too off. I think it's one twenty eight because right. uh, one twenty nine was Plague of the Daleks. No, and that was the end of that trilogy. Then. Ooh, Plague no, of the because- Daleks. Uh, no, because it, no, no, it was one twenty eight because it was it was Eternal Summer. Was it Eternal Summer, Castle of Fear? Castle uh, of Fear? No, it was trilogy. Was Castle of Fear, uh, the Eternal Summer. Yeah, the Eternal Summer and um, Plague of the Daleks. Plague of the Daleks. Yeah. Oh, so okay. it was. Oh, so it was one twenty-seven. Then I yep. think. Yeah. Uh, you oh, know oh, what? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take yeah. that. Yeah. I'll t- I'll take that. Yeah. I mean, at least yeah. I didn't say. You know, I I think it was ninety-two. I I I feel, you know, being <laughs> one or two <laughs> off is. <laughs> 92 but, was uh, <laughs> year Nocturne. of... Uh, oh, no, Nocturne. Uh, oh, yeah. Not a bad story. Dan Abnett. Yeah. Dan Abnett story. <laughs> See, Dan Abnett should write for uh, more for Big Finish. I do like Dan mm. Abnett, but I suppose he's too busy doing Black Library. I mean, r- regarding some of the... Uh, I have a question to you <laughs> regarding some of the writers for Big Finish. Uh, mm. Have you known... Are they... Are some of these writers just moving on or are they done with big finish because i mean and when we get to the whole uh bernice summerfield i have heard of none of those writers and then they were doing a writing i I think they're trying to introduce new blood into you know the writers which is which is understandable i can see why because if you look at it they've got a very very small pool haven't they really well I mean, of, you know, w- when you look prizes. at when you look at some of the earlier days, I mean, they had Alan Barnes, who you know has popped in from time to time. Uh, they've had Barnaby Edwards, mm. um, Stephen Cole. I, I, I loved Eddie Robson, and I feel mm. as though I mean he did make some appearances in the Doom Coalition. But he hasn't really. I mean, we've been getting a lot of Fitton and a lot of Dorney. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it would be nice to have a bit more variety. I must admit. Well, the main um, range have more variety, but interestingly, um, in what was it, Blood on Santa's Claw, we are getting a, a new companion, Perry. It's it's her boyfriend, apparently. 
So mm. hmm, that's not going to end well, is it? No, it's mm. oh, not. Not if it's the one from the Piss Gun Paradox. It's not. So that should be interesting. Yeah, no, I think they're doing <clears throat> more competitions to get more, you know, new blood involved. Which um, I appreciate with, with that English. they, uh, because I feel as though, and uh, oh, I, this is getting way off tangent and from our show notes, but whatever. I feel as though, actually, it leads us perfectly into our next thing, because I feel as though Big Finish is doing these writing competitions, getting... Uh, fan talent because the fans are kind of more in the loop of where Doctor What's Who, where they want mm. Doctor Who to be at, yeah. compared to, I guess you could say the new series because yeah. transition here uh, series 12 creative staff was announced a, co- a little while ago so we have three new writers joining the show. We have Nina Metaver, which I'm butchered the last name, who co-created this Netflix series, The A-List, and previously served on Doctor Who as a, a script editor. And I watched the A-List tra- uh, uh, trailer on Netflix. There's no way I'm actually watching that uh, series because it looks like, to me personally, <laughs> it looks like a second tier or third tier version of the show that I like to watch on the CW, which is Riverdale. I feel as though it's very teen drama-y. And I'm like, and so when I saw that, I'm like, okay, person who writes uh, teen drama scripts is going to write an episode of Doctor Who. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the next one is Maxine Alderton, who is a writer for Emmerdale and and the CBBC's The Worst Witch. And then Charlene James worked on Sky Atlantic's The Discovery of Witches and aw- and was awarded the Alfred Fagan Award for the Best New Play at the National Theater called Cutting Cutting It. And so we have three new writers, which again, I am not opposed to new blood. I I hope that they go in a good way. And Shibnall also has a good vision for like it, you know, kind of like a good storyline for them to work on. Yeah but, yeah, but he doesn't though. That's the problem. Well, it's uh... so we also have four new directors for the series. We have Nida Manzor, who worked on uh, Enterprise. We have hmm. Emma Sullivan, who graduated from National Film and Television School. According to the bio, that's it. We have yeah. Jamie Ma- Magnus Stone, who was nominated for a BAFTA for his short film, Orbit Ever After. And according to what I found, that's it. And we have Lee Haven Jones, who studied at RADA and was the lead director on the ITV series The Bay. So we have brand new directors. We have brand new writers. Not a lot of experience. And, and zero sci-fi, apart from Charlene and, James, and, really. And here, here's my, I guess, concern. And but I, I, I will preface this by saying, and I don't know. I, I feel as though in society, when we want to hire somebody, we are constantly looking for, to hire people with experience. However, people who don't have experience don't get hired because they don't have experience. Have experience, l- yeah. L- l- leading. So I understand everybody needs a door open to get in to get their foot in Mm -hmm. but to have as many new writers and as many new directors or kind of first time kind of make this is like a a a big tv series and to be Mm -hmm. this being your first Mm -hmm. big tv series to be cutting your teeth on is Mm -hmm. a little bit concerning yeah and I mean, and this is the thing. I mean, we, we could play that clip. This is a mass appeal show. Has to appeal to all sides of the argument. You can't just be the left wing show or the right wing show. You can't. So we finally have some news on the not so anticipated Doctor Who series 12, which was originally sold to us as a course correction, but it looks like the double and triple down is going to happen. It's been a little over two years since Jodie Whittaker was announced as the 13th Doctor, and it's been a little over a year since series 11 premiered and the show died and to think 
Peter Jackson wanted to direct an episode of Doctor Who not that long ago, and now we are getting the Doctor's directors. Now, I hope you're following me because I'm actually building up to something. It looks like, at the very least, we are going to get a repeat of Series 11, but based on what I've heard, it's going to be worse, but in line with what is happening to other franchises in 2019 and back to 2018, we've seen Star Trek sacrifice Spock to elevate Michael Burnham. We've seen Star Wars sacrifice Luke Skywalker to elevate Rey. We've seen Marvel Comics sacrifice multiple characters to elevate their new female characters, which all led to divided fan bases and all led to lost sales. And it looks like since Doctor Who doesn't really need to worry about sales as much, well, they actually say that, but that's not true. It looks like they're going to be doing that to their main character, but the thing is, they're going to be subverting their main character with their main character. They're going to sacrifice their previous doctors to elevate the current doctor. There's nothing wrong with diversity and inclusivity, and I've said that as long as these people are talented. You do want to have a merit-based system, especially in art, especially with a giant franchise. Doctor Who has the TV licenses, but that is not nearly enough to help the show, and neither are ratings, and there have been articles about that. It needs its licensing deals, and it needs its merchandising. Now, it just got a lot of money from HBO Max. We're not sure how much, but hopefully that will make up for the lack of merchandise, which is nowhere. They are bleeding in that department. Well, I think partially genuine. They are also virtue signals and they are also cost saving measures. You are not hiring experienced writers, so you don't have to pay them experienced writers wages. And my theory is when you get inexperienced writers and directors and creatives, who don't know Doctor Who that well, they have no problem treading on the canon. And this is where the rumor comes in. It looks like they want to be right in line with current year. It looks like they don't want the Doctor being connected to her male predecessors. So it looks like they're going to be playing around in the Time Lord's past. Again, to the YouTube police and everybody out there who will concern troll me, don't worry, I am reporting this as a rumor that I cannot so, confirm in any way, shape, or form. I, I, I cut, I believe the original video was about 20-ish minutes. I c condensed yeah. that into about three. I cut down a lot of the, the, some of the, I felt as though unnecessary discussion regarding, I mean, I, I, I believe I gave you the directors and the writers pretty succinctly compared to mm -hmm. how he did it. He brings up some good points, though. Like, mm -hmm. if if they are talented, like, grab them. But don't grab them just so that you can have, um, you know, be, uh, you know, applauded for having a massive uh, staff of female writers or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Like, let's – could we focus on the quality of the show? And – and, and Sorry, also, also what I find interesting, I, I spoke to a friend recently, and, and he's kind of a, a writer, and he wants to publish, or get published, but he wants to do it, he wants to do, to do it for an agent rather than self-publish, because once you've self-published, apparently uh, no agent or company will, you know, will, will, will touch you, which I think is kind of sad. Yeah. But anyway, it states on a lot of agents profiles now that they want females specifically which i think is really sad like you know they, they they won't they won't employ male writers or, or they're 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 more interested in, in in employing female writers now than 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 male and i think you know again it's sort of pc sjw kind of well thing i mean gone nuts i mean if if true, so here's the thing: you want to be very, you want to be inclusive. You want to make sure everybody is involved, regardless of you know gender, uh, you know religion, uh, background, culture, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you actively go to pursue just one thing, like you know, that's like the like you're you're not helping 
like the feminism mm -hmm. movement. You are basically trying to just placate it, which yeah. if you're fill, filling things just with one type of gender or one type of uh, you know way of thinking, you're really not you you might have quality quantity but yeah you, you you know by you being over inclusive you're not being inclusive mm. yeah <clears throat> mm -hmm. and i mean and, and this is the thing about chibnall you know he yes he is a good writer he is a a steady um you know sort of half decent drama writer uh who can write a good <laughs> you know a good soap opera or a good you know drama on ITV slash BBC, but um, you know Doctor Who has always been visionary. He's always been experimental. He is not experimental. That's well, why Series Eleven <laughs> was, you know, you know, was so bad. <laughs> because yeah. and well, uh, and it, here's vision. an interest. Just one second. So, uh, I'd I'd love to get your tank on this because. At one point in time, he was very visionary. I mean, at least in yeah, oh yeah, he and w w something that was brought up on Twitter for I don't know how long, but it was brought up numerous times over the past week or so, and it all revolves around the Cybermen story that is is expected to happen during series twelve, and that is the Cyberwoman story that he did for Torchwood was very experimental, was very out there. And to many fans, it was supremely ex successful. What, what happened when... Like, it, it, you could almost say the same thing that happened with Moffat when he took over as showrunner. He, I mean, Blink was great. The Woman in the Fireplace was amazing. Like, he was really innovative. He was thinking about it. But is it the pressure of being the showrunner so burdensome that it takes some of that creativity out because you just want to, like, uh, well... I mean, my favorite part of that clip was that moment at the very beginning by Stephen Moffat when he was interviewed when he said... This is a mass appeal show. It has to appeal to all sides of the argument. You can't just be the left-wing show or the right-wing show. You can't. I, I love that. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that states it perfectly. And that's mm -hmm. what this show should be. But if, if that's what this show should be, you need to have writers... Uh, uh, with who different are capable of writing that well not just yeah who are capable of writing that but they also <laughs> kind of have to think that way too because yeah. again when when we did the Malcolm Hulk thing Malcolm Hulk and T Terry Nation were compared and it was seen at the time that they are two different kind of people but i believe uh, Humphrey even brought it up they're more similar than they would like to believe that they Admit. were oh yeah completely exactly completely and and I and I I just think that Doctor Who is, is is lost that kind of visionary stroke. Yes, Moffat had a, had a lot to answer for, but you know, and and a lot of his era I I don't particularly like. But at least he was trying to be experimental, you know, or handing it over handing over the reins to scriptwriters and and stuff to do that. Whereas Series Eleven was just. Yes, uh, I like the message in some of the in some of the things, and and you know Rosa was was again quite uncomfortable to watch, and this and this I mean again it, it it's on reflection it's a both a fantastic episode but also I don't know do you do you think it, it's gone it's, too far because I mean well it was un because it was uncomfortable to watch as a white male, mm. and you just think it, if you've got a young kid watching that. You know how impressionable are they going to be, and in, in what context? Yes, I know that you know that, that they're trying to you know teach about history and whatever, but is it too like much? I mean, talking to you know e e you know talking to a, a, a another fellow American, you know she was saying that they're you know they're kind of raised on this stuff that they're you know, or, or you guys are raised on sort of your history and your your your, your heritage and your rights. But as a as a as a, a British show and as as Brits, we didn't really have that. 
so to see that so blatantly you know kind of that you know that racism and and that thing so blatant in a a family show you know i can see why people are like mm, this is a bit uncomfortable you know uh, uncomfortable to watch whether that's just a cultural thing again you know i guess it is down to interpretation you know not saying it was a bad episode because it wasn't it was a really good episode and 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 it you know in a lot of ways it was quite groundbreaking but in a lot of ways as i say it was also quite mm, you know for uh maybe if it was more <coughs> adult orientated then <clears throat> great but it's a family show yeah. Uh, I mean, what's your take, Brett, on on that? I mean, do you did you see where I'm coming from? Um, I mean, did you agree I, with? Yeah. That? I mean, so I mean, like like we've said, and Humphrey said in one of the previous ones, Doctor Who's always like has a message, and it, the message could be un taken uncomfortably. However, it, th this kind of episode was kind of done similarly. In that the 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 doctor's daughter episode, where you had the two different kind of races that were essentially like hated each other be because of racism, mm -hmm. to me that is more easily watched or rewatched again compared to Rosa. I would yes. actually like to say Rosa, on its first viewing, it was a, a remarkable episode. It was uncomfortable, mm. but because it was uncomfortable because it was true. And there is some importance in educating the youth. But at the same time, when you come to a show and kind of expect to be kind of entertained, and you could almost say at one point in time, you're not being entertained by Rosa. No, you're, you are you're kind being... of being lectured yeah, and you're... warned. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I hope history never repeats itself. But at the same time, Rosa, for as great as it is, to me, is the most unrewatchable Doctor Who ever. I mean, we we've we've said, you know, th there's a you know, Time and the Ronnie, not a good episode. You know, the Twin Dilemma, not a good episode. A couple, uh, you know, um, Fear Her, horrible. I, I would say I would willingly rewatch all of those before I watch Rosa again because not that it's a bad episode, but I don't want to feel bad about myself. I, I, even though I've never done anything like that before, no. there is some sort of guilt associated with the episode. And I don't feel that kind of guilt regarding uh, the doctor's daughter. I don't feel that kind of guilt around the, the two doctors or you know, the time in the Ronnie, I don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, and again, I, I, and I, I can kind of, you know, I do agree with you there. I mean, I want to watch the show because I enjoy the show. I enjoy the characters. I, you know, for the most part, I enjoy the doctor. I don't want to be guilt tripped in, in something that I love. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Um, you know, so for all its, you know, realism, I still think there are better ways to to do something and still be real and not be, you know, as guilt trippy. I mean, again, I know you don't like it, Brett, and you're not a fan. But again, even sort of, you know, look at the Behemoth, for example, in in, in Big Finish. That mm -hmm. that story was quite, you know, close to the bone in regards what was going on at that time. But as the Doctor yeah. said, it's slavery. It happened. You know, see, and and that's what I liked know? also about Tartarus is, and the, the, to me, the difference between Behemoth and Tartarus is Tegan was upset regarding the slavery, and the doctor just said, This happened, and they kind of more or less let it go compared to the Behemoth, where you had Flip and um, what's her face, Constance, Constance. constantly like trying to, uh, but doctor, we could change this, uh, but we could change this, but we could change this. And that's the part of the behemoth that I hated because mm. it is ingrained in history. And I will say again with Rosa, Graham horribly had to do the probably worst thing ever. He knew it was wrong. 
and he had to do it because he can't change history. And it wasn't a whole big debate. Oh, should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I, uh, we, we didn't have to listen to that. It was it was in history. It had to happen, and therefore it did happen. Compared to the behemoth, where it was just like, oh, come on, doctor, this is wrong. Slavery is bad. Blah blah blah. And like, it, it, there was so much time in the behemoth that was devoted to let's change it. Compared to Tartarus and also Rosa to one extent, to where it was just like, nope, it happened. This has to always happen here. We can't change it. End of discussion. Mm. Yeah. I mean, but then, but then, you know, that that throws up a, a question in my eyes of. Whitaker's doctor's moral compass again. <clears throat> well, it's <clears throat> all over you... the place. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, the, 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 know, be, because the fact that the, the, she allowed him one, to do that. J just one second. Best companion for the thirteenth doctor, whose moral compass is all over the place. Clara. Tula. Tula. <laughs> oh, or, or, or no, Clara. Clara. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I would true. Say, um, Clara, the yeah. lady who you know, Bill's friend. Bill's friend? Oh, the pi the pi the pilot? Yeah. What? The best yeah. companion for the what for the thirteenth doctor? You mean? Yeah. Why? I just thought it'd be interesting. You know, just huh. a bit different. Hmm. So I'd throw but, a different idea out there, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I I can see your point again with you know. With 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 Clara, um, <laughs> but but no, I mean, I mean again, and I, I can't remember who who raised it. I was watching a, a video on YouTube, and it was the whole thing about I think uh, the I don't know whether I sent it to you or if it was another video that I didn't, but it was talking about the, you know, the sort of eleventh Doctor's eleventh Doctor, sorry, thirteenth Doctor's moral compass, when like oh, she. Yeah. When she, um... Yep, I, I got that. Just a second. Oh, you have? Okay. Doctor Who wasn't already dead prior to Chibnall's rise. By series 10, it was clear that it was running out of steam. World Enough and Time and The Doctor Falls were great, but the rest of the episodes found themselves sitting in the mediocre margin. So there is no doubt that the show needed a breath of fresh air, and it was incredibly exciting when it was announced that Chris Chibnall would be taking the reins of showrunner. Everyone had such confidence in him. The internet was covered in comments along the lines of, oh yeah, Chibnall knows what he's doing. Doctor Who's in safe hands. Even though the reveal that Jodie Whittaker would be playing the 13th Doctor caused the entire fan base to split in two, the general hype for the show proved to remain strong amongst fans, myself included. But as Series 11 landed on our screens, oh how our expectations fooled us. How we sat and stared at this once treasured TV gem with such confusion as it was torn to pieces. This is where Chibnall went wrong. This is how Chibnall killed Doctor Who. Chibnall's first mistake was Series 11's isolation from the rest of the show's history. The decision to reject any previously seen villains or characters immediately meant that the Doctor had no one to remind us that they were the Doctor. This is not how to take Doctor Who in a different direction. Moffat executed a new direction brilliantly in Series 5. He brought a whole new vibe to the show, which was very different. But by Episode 3, we had seen the Daleks. And by Episode 4, the Weeping Angels and River Song. Links were made to previous episodes in the timeline, and it felt like Doctor Who very quickly. I imagine that Chibnall assumed that a couple of references dotted around Series 11 would keep old fans happy, but it didn't. Chibnall wanted to get new fans into the show, which was perfectly all right, apart from the fact that he was ignoring at least the past 10 years of the show's revival. There were times in series 11 that both Chibnall and Whittaker had opportunities to develop the 13th Doctor, but never went through with it. Through his pathetic writing, Chibnall has ended up creating a Doctor that lacks so much empathy and care that someone could probably diagnose 13 as a sociopath. Some may argue that the 12th Doctor lacked care in series 8, but Moffat did that intentionally whereas Chibnall has not. This was seen in Arachnids in the UK, after Graham gave a heartwarming speech about wanting to travel with the Doctor after losing Grace. The Doctor didn't even acknowledge what Graham said, or the difficult time he'd been through. 
She just looked past him and asked Ryan and Yaz if they wanted to come along too. Which brings me to Chibnall's next mistake, his target audience. If you ask me, Chibnall aimed this series at seven-year-old newcomers whose enjoyments of TV programmes are fulfilled with a nice little special effect. Since 2005, Doctor Who has attracted a wide demographic, and from what I can see, more teenagers and young adults started watching in the Moffat era. Chibnall has excluded the majority of the people who are watching the show's revival just so he can get away with lazy, weak writing and aim it at people who really don't care about the show. The Sarah Jane Adventures was specifically a children's TV show, yet still managed to entertain older Doctor Who fans who happened to tune in. The ratings dropped considerably throughout Series 11, with Resolution being the least watched Doctor Who special ever. Hmm. I mean, uh, he, he makes a really good point. I, I, I will say, when I watched Doctor Who, I, I didn't notice the whole, you know, Graham, you know, in kind of, I guess you could say, mourning. But uh, well, there was, was a point yeah. that... Well, he was, and he, and I cut out the part where he referenced the um, uh, "It takes you away," where mm. Graham is off in the distance, just staring as the Doctor is talking to uh, the girl and both Yasmin and Ryan, and mm. and then he's just like, "Come along," she just goes, "Come along, Graham," and you, you, it's I I didn't I never noticed that. That I, I I appreciate these YouTubers and also podcasters because they bring to light things that I didn't pay attention because there it, it, it yeah I, I I don't know what to say it's just what's going on with the writing because I will say mm. and um at least regarding the returning writers besides Chris Chibnall there's three returning writers and I think out of all the writers for series 11, these ones are the ones that are most deservedly to be back again. You have Vinay Patel who wrote Demons of the Punjab. You have Ed Himmy who wrote T It Takes You Away. And then Pete McTeague who wrote Kerblam. Hmm. Although let's be fair to the, uh, the, the YouTuber who was, uh, was it, is it Nedrotic was saying about Pete McTeague. He's been known for doing more, you know, women's prison thing and uh yeah i was like but yeah I, he's, he's I, got issues to sort out <laughs> but, <laughs> Which, I, but i but i enjoyed kerblam it was a uh, good story see i i did up to the you know the reveal of of, of of the guy and the main villain and i just thought uh and again he's right it's see, a white male again but but I, see here's here to me here's the beauty of kerblam and i can look past the white male because Here's to me where I found the most enjoyment out of it is, again, when, when you look back at some of the most successful. In fact, I, I, I went over to my brother's house uh, two Fridays ago and we, we played some games. And while we were playing some some games, my brother's friend was, you know, we were talking, oh, do you watch this? No, I don't watch this. Do you watch this? Uh, and then he says, do you watch Doctor Who? And I kind of smiled thinking that my brother had told him that I'm a massive Doctor Who fan. And I go, yeah, of course. He goes, oh, I can't stand that show. It terrifies the crap out of me. And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, the first episode that I watched was Blink. He goes, I, ca I, can't, <laughs> look at stat I can't look at statues the same anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm sitting there thinking, that's the beauty of it. You take exactly. something mundane and every day and make it scary and then he goes i go i go you only watched that episode and he goes no no no. i, I watched uh, this one with the these uh shop uh mannequins come to life i go oh rose that's the first episode he goes yeah he goes i'm now terrified of, of, of. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like i'm and i'm like that's that's the beauty of it you have these store department store mannequins that are very mundane and and ordinary and yet they come alive and they kill people. That is the most beautiful thing about it. And then you have Kerblam, where, like, as a kid growing up, I loved popping, like, all those little, you know, uh, whatever. The, the, yeah, mm. the, the bubble wrap stuff. I love that. And you know what? Whenever I get a package with bubble wrap, I look at it twice now. Just Because <laughs> <and, laughs> I, I don't bomb? know. It could be. Exactly. <laughs> and so, to me... Regardless uh. of who the villain actually was, I found beauty in them taking something ordinary and mundane and turning it into something scary. 
And yes. that's what I loved about Kerblam. <clears throat> true, true. And that's definitely a uh, I, and, it, and again, sorry, say again, Humphrey? That's definitely a sort of throwback, because like in the Colin Bacon era, that was kind of how they did things. Mm. And again, if, if you look at uh, Nerd Rothic, he he says that um, the fact that it was, you know, a Kerblam could be or could not be kind of uh, um, linked to Amazon, and the fact that they leaked it early, and now Doctor Who is no longer on Amazon, <laughs> which I which love. Is quite funny. I a- I absolutely love that. I mean, to to me, Amazon that that's like the biggest f u. I you know what? I appreciate <laughs> a really good f u to somebody. I I I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So definitely regarding series twelve of Doctor Who, it is rumored, and now it's kind of confirmed. It, it, so, but at the time that I wrote the show notes, it is rumored that although there will be no Christmas special, series twelve will begin New Year's Day as the first part of a two-part story. Part two will be airing Saturday, January fourth, which I do appreciate because mm. we're not. I, I, it would kill me to go a complete whole week between part one and part two, even yeah. unless it's a you know unless it really sucks, then it mm. won't kill me the least bit. Um, also, ooh, teaser. So uh, I know you and Humphrey are going to be gone for a while. And so, you know, tr- trying to keep the podcast relevant, I, you know, there's a couple things that I was going to do. I, you know, review, uh, season 23 Blu-ray as well as season 10, but yeah. I went to the comic book shop the other day and I found, and no- most of the time I would pass it up, but today I decided to pick up the Doctor Who, the 13th Doctor holiday special comic. And I will Is do it as a bad special. As the Star Wars holiday special comic. That's the question. <laughs> well, I have not, the, I've, the I've not cracked it. I have not crack, cracked it open yet. Oh. But I will say, at least one bright part is one of the writers. For this uh, holiday special comic is Jody Hauser, and she currently is a one of the writers for uh, Supergirl in the DC comic range. So, right. Regardless of at least it's, I feel as though there's some qualifications there. Yeah. Yeah. Also, a Twitter thread and poll started by the woman of Who asked the following question regarding series 12 they said are you hoping series 12 to be similar in tone to series 11 or are you hoping for something completely different and it at, when it, uh, the poll was done it received just a little under uh, 1200 votes wow. the options were similar to series 11 completely different and and then the other one was other comment below and most of the comments for the other was well I'd like some similarities, but I'd like some differences. So basically, that's what uh, most people said for yeah. other. Out of all those three options, 16% of uh, the people who responded to that poll would like it to be similar to Series 11. Huh. 73% of the people, completely different. Good. And 9% said other. So yeah. I'm in total agreement with that poll, to be fair. No, no, I, I was because I, I don't know if the uh, women of who have a podcast, but I do know that they they do their their Twitter account was in existence before the Thirteenth Doctor was ever revealed to be uh, a woman. So mm-hmm. they've been really involved in you know enjoying the a lot of the companions you know from Donna to Martha and all the others. So. You know, they've always had a strong presence, and yeah. I, I appreciate yeah. reading some of their contributions, and I, I, I feel as though they are rational, or rational regarding the whole thing, also. Mm. Here's a question. Talking of Series 12 and, and stuff that was actually mentioned in, in the videos, but I think you cut out, possibly, I don't know, unless you've got another video. No. Um, what do you feel about the writers going back and <clears throat> retconning? Continuity. Oh, I, I thought I thought that being... was in the first cut that I did the uh, by Nerdrotic. But the thing is, they're going to be subverting their main character 
with their main character. They're going to sacrifice their previous doctors to elevate the current doctor. Um, it's going to, it basically said in that cut that um, they're going to wreck on it. So the, <clears throat> the, the doctor uh, was actually born a girl. And the first doctor isn't technically the first doctor. Uh, there's a rumor that, you know, we don't know how many regeneration cycles she's had, but it apparently yeah. won't be the first. Which, ah, uh, if that's, if that's so, the case, that will that will I think for me just completely just crap on Moffat's era, you know, with the whole. Well, it craps on every era. And it brings me to something that I was going to get a little bit into later on in uh, the news segment of this. But to me, and, and this is how I see that, he said it's an unconfirmed rumor. And however, even though there's this unconfirmed rumor, I don't know if it's just it just got so big. I mean, it was everywhere. It was on Newsarama. It was on this. It was on that. It was for it being an unconfirmed rumor. It was everywhere. Yeah. And so I don't know if it just. Ex yeah. So it, one is could argue that because of how. Big it got there could be some val validity to the whole thing. Uh. That would actually pull me away from, and, and, and he, here's also my concern also. I, I have two concerns. This, if true, could really massively destroy the show because I feel as though, and I'm not saying that, because like, you're messing with continuity. It does, you know, if the first doctor, you know, if, we started off with zero doctor and it was, you know, regeneration didn't start with one. We don't, I mean, this would, this all goes down to how you count. Do you start off with one or do you start off with zero? If you start off with zero and she started off with a little, as a little girl, well, then that takes away from David Tennant's story at the, at, during the, um, uh, what is it? The, the two part special. I can't think of what it's called. End of time. The end of, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I, yes. I, so that 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 would take away from that. That would also take away from the twelfth doctor when he's recounting his life, his life in the barn, you know, in Smallville. Oh, sorry, uh, got Superman and Doctor Who mixed up for a second. Um, it would but also that would take like, away from it, it. would also take away from the Valyard and the Sixth Doctor as well, wouldn't it? You know. Yes, it, it would completely change it. So I feel as though, if true, you are taking a wrecking ball to the story, and, and also ending and ending it in and, many fans' and, lives. And also the the uh, the Eleventh Doctor's regeneration into the Twelfth, because Clara had to ask the Daniels for a whole new regeneration cycle. That's true. Yeah. That so, is true. Yeah, if, mm -hmm. I really hope And so, through, and, it, it and, and my concern, really... here's my other concern. Let's say it happens. Mm -hmm. Let's say that they do that and they say that the, 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 you know, the William Hartnell doctor was not the first doctor. He was, did not grow up as a child. And, you know, that was the end of his first regeneration cycle. That was his first, uh, that was the first part of his second set of regeneration cycles and Something the first part the, was you know, all women that basically now, that basically like you know that, that he remembers because again exactly linked into the thing of linked into the thing of this whole quote-unquote timeless child thing and they're like oh it's even hidden from you you know so <laughs> if that happens i will say it will destroy the show to some extent to where mm. if the the show is not already destroyed what they will have to do is they will have to get a new scriptwriter or a, a new, you know, replace Chibnall. And here would this would just kill even more fans if they kind of do what like they do, like in Marvel and comic book world is reset continuity. They did it in mm. BBC books because what had happened in BBC books is they got too convoluted in so many like series arcs and all of these um 
uh, crises and stuff like that, that they part of what they did, and I haven't read all the stories, but I, I, as I started reading them, I started reading some Amazon reviews and they said, if you are reading this, just know in a, you know so many books down the line, they are going to just wipe all of this from the doctor's memory because of all of these paradoxes got too much and too convoluted. So they, they just decided to wipe everything out. So if they do go down this Chipnell thing, which is just rumored at this time, and then it destroys the show and viewership plummets, they either have two choices of either going on with the show, getting a new script editor, and then undoing that. And then undoing that would also cause some of those fans that stuck with the show now saying, well, wait, the 13th Doctor is now not part of canon? because Chipnell went too far. So then that would destroy that fandom and basically kill the show. And the only place where the show would ever exist for probably another 10, 20 years would be on Big Finish. Which I'm fine with, frankly. Oh yeah, I'm fine with that. Because that leads me to, uh, do you have any, uh, Humphrey, what are your thoughts on, on this? Yeah, I agree with you. Um. Yeah, I think if they did that, well, it would just com that would completely get rid of fandom, you know, from that series. Everyone would like turn to like Big Finish and Classic Who and all of that sort of stuff. And yeah, I agree with you. It just if they reset it, it would destroy it. It's just pff, no, it it wouldn't work. It would not work if they brought that concept in at all. I, I, I think that is not a sensible idea. No. In interesting thing that just popped up on my Twitter timeline. So I've been watching the DC Universe apps series, series two of uh, Titans, yeah. and a lot of people did not like how the last episode at the end of series two ended. And according to a Twitter thread, the writers are f aware of this and are now making changes to series three because of the fan backlash. Wow. Would, does that sound like a, something like you would appreciate in a show slash showrunner slash uh, entity that takes care of it? Yes. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, again, to sort of go off, go off tangent, but also stick with with, with science fiction. It, it's like, um, you know, Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker. I've been, you know, li listening and watching videos and stuff, and the fact that you know it's not even finished yet. They they are madly trying to finish it, and there's you know been test screenings and stuff where fans have just walked out. You know, they well, they have so... twenty five days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's what I mean. Whereas, again, as 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 I think, you know, Drotic and uh, what was it, Doctor Victor von Doomcock, <laughs> interesting mm. name, but anyway, definitely, um, or, or Lord <laughs> Lord DVD on on YouTube <clears throat> was saying um, that um, that basically fans were so were so annoyed with the the the, 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 the test screenings they walked out, but Disney have kept in the bit fans were annoyed at. Um, so that, that, that's that's just so weird because that that uh, you know what to me and I I I have no like you know what whatever Disney wants to do you know I understand they're a corporation or whatever but after a while you have to realize they, they, somebody needs to tell them that what they are doing even though they are bringing in millions and billions of dollars because they bought Marvel because they have this because they have that and because every single kid wants to see their product for or something that just because they can doesn't mean, doesn't mean that they, they should, should. No. because i mean what is it the last week there was all those memes and stuff like that of baby yoda being taken down because mm -hmm. they, they didn't really? like it yeah uh, well, people the, because wow. of the um mandalorian what is it that the, the mandalorian mm. that there was a quick segment of baby yoda and people mm -hmm. were making their own baby yoda they take me baby yoda ye uh, make ye memes out of mm -hmm. them and stuff like mm -hmm. that and disney just started plucking them out of twitter what? because they did Seriously? not like it oh, yes come on 
what is wrong with that? Like, oh, do you see cool. the BBC do that to Doctor Who fans? Or no, they don't. Do any other fantasy, you know, fantasy or book, you know, thing that people do? I mean, that's the point of artists. I don't know. I haven't you know, seen Le- Legion in a while. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but no, I, I mean, it's just crazy. So keeping in line with what we need to talk about before we get to the reviews... So, uh, BBC Studios has announced that Fury from the Deep will be the latest missing story to be animated. The announcement was part of an animation panel at London Comic Con. All six episodes will be animated in high definition in both color and black and white animation with surviving clips from the original series and a making of documentary and other features yet to be announced. Fury from the Deep is due to be released on DVD and Blu-ray with a steel book edition in 2020. And sadly, Region 2 will be the only ones that get the Blu-ray and Steelbook, where, where Region 1 will only just receive the DVD, and it will mm. probably come out, like, nine months later. So whenever that comes up for pre-order, I will be pre-ordering the Steelbook, because I'm not going to wait. Even though I didn't want to wait for season 23 uh, to come out here, and I have yet to crack season 23 open, so I... I've owned it for about two months, and it's going to be released next Tuesday on Blu-ray in Region 1. So perhaps I need to be a t- tad bit more rational regarding things. But <laughs> when it comes to fandom, there is no rationality, correct? This is right, true. That's true. Um, Big Finish News. Uh, Big Fish, Finish Listeners Group posted a picture of Terry Malloy's tweet from B- a Big Finish lunch. And all I can say is, according to the pictures, if this is actually from the lunch, I have no idea why everybody is just so up in arms about it. It's like a buffet with just very many different options of things. There's a, it looks like there's like a chicken curry. There is, you know, some pot stickers, some other things. And I'm sitting there going, this is what people talk about. Like, we, we, we go behind the scenes. <laughs> we go behind the scenes to hear about, you know, this and that. And, you know, talk about the characters and working with so-and-so. And, oh, but, but the no, lunches. Oh, the oh, the legendary lunches. And I'm sitting there looking at this picture. And uh, according to, I mean, the Big Finish Listener groups are quick to pull stuff down when it's not a pro- content appropriate. Even though this is not content appropriate, I do appreciate that they posted these things, but this is not a lunch to you know, talk about for like three minutes on the extras. You mean more like 15. pretty damn good. Yeah, they, they do, but you know what? I mean, like uh, to me, th- this is what I, I came from. Either people in England and the UK don't eat lunch because the Queen has announced that it is against the law to eat lunch. And so, big finish on the side when they're recording, it was like, hey, you know what? We have lunch. We have lunch. And everybody goes, what? No, you gotta be kidding me. Lunch? Oh, this is the best thing ever. (laughs) Give me food. I mean, oh, to me, that, that I mean, that that's what it seems to be. Like, like nobody in England yeah, eats that. lunch. Be- either that, or we're just a bunch of foodies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which, which I don't, I don't understand foodies. I, like, I, so I, I was asked a question: Do you eat? Do you live to eat, or do you eat to live? And I just, I eat to live. That, that's the only one. The reason why I want food, I, I want to continue to exist. If I once I stop existing i promise i will stop eating but i don't like see, I'm wake in, up being see, like i mean i'm in kind of the, uh, i'm in the former category because one i enjoy food and two mm-hmm. here's my hope if i eat enough of it i'll actually gain weight eventually <laughs> yes. so it's kind of my mission in life to you know try as much sort of food as possible and hopefully put on weight and I so, food, so you know yeah. there you go <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so uh, I, but i do I, I do f- find it odd that Facebook allowed that picture because they Ooh. are so quick to stop weird things. And uh, shortly after that, they also announced the birthday of one of their admins. And I'm like, really? Am I oh. on the same Facebook fan page now? Because <laughs> I, <laughs> like, I thought we were only allowed to talk about Doctor Who 
And if it you know, ruffles that. anybody's, if it oh big finish, sorry. If it if it ruffles anybody's feathers, it's quickly ended. But now we have birthday and celebrations and Terry Malloy's lunch. I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I I think I've like gone uh, fallen into some other like multiverse thing or something like that. I, Probably. Yeah. Where, where perhaps my wife is now canon. I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, um, you should write that as like a as a, as like a Doctor Who play. Like that should be that should be a, you know like a thing where the Doctor comes along and like basically uh, you know, has an adventure and with you and basically makes your wife canon uh, and and, and exist. <laughs> That would be awesome. Main that range, would be so awesome. Main range 300. Main my range at least 300. My, my wife exists. <laughs> my wife is <laughs> um, So I, I did find this uh, Facebook fan page rather interesting, and it was actually started by one of the admins. So uh, Craig, one of the admins, posed this question. Main range trilogies, do they work? He says, I'm not convinced they do. With an overarching storyline like Keys to Time, yes, but I don't really get the need or the desire to say three, you know, Sixty and Perry stories in a row um, if they're not otherwise linked. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was like, that's kind of an interesting question. And mm. because it's interesting, I was really surprised that it was on the fan page. But what are your thoughts I, about I, these? I'd agree because, I mean, if you look at the earlier stuff, <clears throat> you know, with the Eighth Doctor, you know, you've got Storm Warning, Sword of Orion, Stones of Venice, Minuet in Hell, you know, and at least at least those four are kind of all linked. They are, yes. <clears throat> um, And yeah, no, they don't. I, I really think they should mix it up a bit more. If you're going to if you're going to have linking stories, have have them linking. But if not, then don't. What I would really like Big Finish to do, and I know they won't, because I, like you said to me uh, on our call uh, last week or a couple days ago, I can't remember. Time is just all blurring all together. It's almost mm -hmm. the end of 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. What's going That's on? Going. I know, right? I know. But we were, you, you made a comment regarding how, you know, after th uh, 300, Big Finish is most likely going to go to box sets for their main range. And I understand that, that that's probably, it makes sense. It also is very cost effective mm -hmm. as well, too. Mm -hmm. But what I think they should do, and I feel as though it would really, I mean, it might annoy people. But I mean, I was listening to some of the earlier Tin Dog podcasts when they would do this. And you'd have an eighth Doctor story in June, and then you'd have a sixth Doctor story in July, and then you'd have a fifth Doctor story in August, mm. and then the second part of the eighth Doctor story would pick up in October. And it, I know for fans it was maddening because you had to wait, but as I've been kind of slowly delving into like the comic book world. And there is some storylines that I'm really interested in, but I, it takes a month for me to... Now, granted, that for that process, it would take you about five months to get that storyline done. And if there was part of a trilogy, it would take you another couple more months to finally get that resolved. But in the end, people are talking about stuff. People are maybe conversing. They are maybe even sharing some of these uh, CDs with their friends, maybe getting other people involved. And isn't that more of a better business model than just go, oh, okay, here's a six doctor story. Here's part one in January, part two in February, part three in March. Okay, next. Uh, fifth doctor story, part one in April, part two in... Yeah. Mm. What, what, I mean, mm. granted, the earlier version would have driven me insane. I, I would yeah. be in a, a straight jacket right now. But it would be it, it would get me talking. It would make me thinking. We uh, podcast. I mean, think about the podcasts that they could that could come up from this. I mean, that's that's where Big Finish kind of also that they need to have a, a a podcast that is kind of associated with them, but allows people to be critical about stuff. You know, it's not yes. all great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, that would be interesting because. Because I was thinking about that the other day, like, like 
because I'm, I'm listening to a couple of different like you know comic book and Doctor Who podcasts, and I feel as though some of them, some of them that I stopped listening to, basically are the ones that there's nothing wrong with the product. And I was thinking, who would be a good podcaster? And the the, the thought occurred to me, uh, our favorite, uh, or at least the the you know, guy who stole uh, 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 Moss ate my Doctor Who uh, scarf. You know the, the you know, he he yeah mm-hmm. he has so much knowledge but at the same time as much knowledge as he has because he's tied into working with big finish because he has ties to the bbc would he Can't dare really be... no, no no he would not mm. he i don't think he would dare to be impartial or, or he had to he has to be, be impartial yeah yeah <laughs> so big finish on twitter asked fans on november 21st big finish is it canon it says, hashtag, start an argument in four words. And Nick Briggs started off by saying, no argument. We launched in 1999. Big Finish issued, or BBC issued a statement saying that we are the official continuation of Doctor Who stories. So there. One person responded with, um, it's all canon. It all counts. Even the Weedabix cards. Another fan said, for me, it's, it goes, TV is greater than audios. Audios are greater than books. Books are greater than comics. And so, of course, Big Finish is canon. And then I think, to me, the best one is <laughs> audios, you know, parentheses, Big Finish, is be- greater than the current TV show. I would agree with that. Yeah, and I love that because... Should Chibnall, should Chibnall do what it's rumored to be doing? That's where it's going to go to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, I, I can almost see, envision Nick Briggs, Jason Head Gallery just sitting there, you know, either you know sacrificing something, you know, doing some bl- blood oath or whatever, and be like, "Please, Chris Chibnall, do it, do it," because <laughs> <laughs> you'll chase fandom away from the TV series. But everybody will be like, "Hey, have you heard of this big finish thing?" And then you know, big finish. Uh, watch like some fo- like agreement between uh, big finish and you know Radio Four drops yeah. because b- the BBC is just like, oh, we can't. Um, uh, no. Um, <laughs> like, and then and then the next tweet from Nick Briggs will just be like, you know, cha ching, hashtag smiley face with the you know money symbols. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Uh... Um. Because at the end of the day, even though the, the BBC show failed, they're still going to be paid through their big finish. So, mm. um, so BF had a, two other Twitter polls I'd like to get to before we move on. Actually, three other ones. So Big Finish t- uh, t- was talking about their originals. I said, Big Finish originals round one. Which of these three audio dramas did you love the most? Cicero, Girl, Jeremiah, Born in Time. Oh. Where does I, I know? I know. Oh, I, come on, that's 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 just that's harsh. That is so harsh because, well, at a girl and Jeremiah Bourne, mood, very mood dependent. If I want comedy, then Jeremiah Bourne. If I want realism and actual, you know, really good drama, not saying Jeremiah Bourne isn't good drama, um, but at a girl. So that's a toughie, really. I can't, I can't really give you a definitive answer for that one. So. I, I quickly and easily voted for Jeremiah Born in Time. Mm. And sadly, so here's how the breakdown. Cicero received 43% of the votes. Adagirl received 38%. And oh. Jeremiah Born in Time, 19 What? <laughs> no. Oh, no, no. To me, this next one is more of a tra- travesty than this one. Because to me, all three of those are mm. like should legitimately be 30 30 30 i mean uh, uh, yeah but this mm-hmm. one this one annoyed me mm-hmm. and i will say i haven't listened to one of these or all or the whole nine hours of one of them and i've only oh, listened to right? f- yeah so it was round two which of these uh, big finish original dramas do you love the most Chillings and Sixpence, Blind Terror, and Transference. Oh, please don't tell me that Chillings and Sixpence came in third. Uh, no, it came in first. 
Good. But <clears throat> this is the thing that surprised me. At, at one point in time when I checked in, I finally, I got before we did this podcast, I found the final tally. But I took a screenshot of where it was when I voted. And when I voted, I, I, I almost decided, thought about creating some other fake Twitter accounts just to vote for shillings and sixpence because I was worried. I was mm. legitimately worried because at the time <laughs> that I originally um, voted, shillings and sixpence had 28%. Blind Terror had 30%. And I was like, uh... did, did we listen to the same audio? Because yeah. I'm going to say, no, we did not. But it ended up with shillings and sixpence getting 38%. Blind Terror got 28%. And Transference got 34%. Mm, okay. Mm. And from, from the reviews that I've seen, and I again, I don't have nine hours to set aside for Transference. But from yeah, the I've, reviews I I've well, heard. I mean, I mean, we will, though, because we'll obviously be flying oh. over. Oh, yeah. So probably perfect. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll have to let me yeah. know. Mm. But... Um, transference from the reviews i've seen on timescale and other places a lot of people really love that sh series and are mm. keeping their fingers crossed for a second series so there there must be more than just the first chapter that they dropped for free that i listened to because that's yeah. kind of all i i wanted to give it a try because i was not mm. willing to you know drop nine hours of my life mm. <laughs> <laughs> um and finally, the last one. What is your big, your favorite big finish multi doctor story? They put the Daughter of the Gods, the Legacy of Time, Cold of Fusion, and then their fourth option was Other. Please specify. What I, would you. I'd actually be inclined to say uh, Daughter of the Gods I, because what I like about it is it's not a typical multi doctor story. You know, Legacy of Time is brilliant, but it's, you know, it's a, an anniversary thing. So it's, you yeah, know, it's and good. Yeah, Doctors only, only come into in, in like the last five minutes, let's be honest. Yeah, whereas I like... Uh, yeah, I like, and, I, and I like Cold Fusion as well. That was Cold good. Fusion oh, yeah. is very good. Um, it's very good. But I would say for me, Daughter of the Gods is a slightly better episode. So I haven't listened to Daughter of the Gods, but like you said, Legacy of Time is an anniversary episode, yeah. and I. But granted, I'm it gonna, won first place because I'm I'm going to say I, you put the four Doctors right. I almost did. I did Perry and the Piscan pa Paradox because oh, I I love like you know the the first story is rather serious with Perry and the Fifth Doctor, uh. But once the second story starts and you have Colin Baker, uh, the sixth doctor, in the the the, <laughs> the Piskin <laughs> out suit, that is so funny. It is I, I mean, I just I to me that one I, I love the four doctors. Don't get me wrong. I listen to like the four doctors at least once a month. I love that that much. Yeah. But I I I, I I'm not exaggerating too it's like like just before i go to bed i have my i'm not gonna say her name i have my echo device and i l listen to s audios as i drift as to sleep and at least once a month it's just like all right i think it's time for perry or not perry uh, the four doctors and i love it i love it <laughs> so much stupid question but how do you get uh how do you get um, it play audio through. So through the um, what? Let me just pull this up. So through the Amazon Alexa app. app um, <laughs> or uh, sorry, no, not not through the app. Through your settings on Bluetooth, you have to find the Echo's name, and then from that point forward, all I have to do, or, and then I just kind of connect it. And then all I have to do is just say, oh, you know, uh, Alexa, connect. She'll say searching. And then she'll say, now connected to whatever your phone is named. And then you can play your audio from it. Oh, yes. 
<clears throat> so at this point in time, we've been recording the podcast for about two hours or so. If you look at the time, though, it is only about 90 minutes into the podcast, which means we have not actually gotten to the September and October reviews for 2019 that we had planned on. And we had yet to still get to the Resurrection of the Daleks review of the audiobook that we, again, had initially planned on. We had a really great time. A lot of it that was cut was maybe kind of too off the wall or really that just did not have anything to do with anything connected to the Doctor Who or Big Finish uh, you know, reality, which sometimes I keep some of that stuff in, but oftentimes I cut it out. So one thing that I've been thinking about is either, A, continuing doing the practice of just cutting it out, or perhaps doing a... Uh, Patreon uh, podcast where the the you know for a buck a month or something like that you can get the pre-recorded uh, discussions that we have before we do the podcast or the parts that just get way too weird that I decide to cut and you know that could be thrown into a podcast. So those are two things that I've been thinking about doing. The podcast will still remain free. But the, the, some of the, just the extra bits will, could possibly be thrown into something extra. That's just something that we've been toying with, or I've been toying with the idea of. But, uh, yeah. Now back to the original script of the podcast. Anyway. So, oh, Big Finish the, News. Yeah, they've announced two mm -hmm. box sets. Well, two more <clears throat> uh, box sets. One is a new IPA, and uh, the other one is obviously class volumes three and four. Annoyingly, not going to be with Catherine Kelly or Vivian Opera anymore. Before Seems now, like they didn't they? enjoy their time at Big Finish. Catherine Kelly obviously plays Quill, and Vivian Opera plays Tanya. And so they've done recasts. Oh, um, really? I did, did not see the, that. Yeah, did you read the feed on, 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 the Big, Finish, on Big Finish listeners group about Class Volume 3 and 4? It's quite interesting. I did not. Read, um, uh -uh. If you read it, because it, it's, it's got some input from Scott, uh, from Scott Hancock. Hmm. Uh, and I, I did do I did I also chipped in as well. So you might want to have a gander at that. So it says so. Connor started the thread. Hmm. Class volumes three and four has been announced. Big finish couldn't secure Catherine Kelly or Vivian Oprah or to return as Miss Quill, and it now play. So Miss Quill is now being played by Dervia Kerwan, and Tanya is being played by Joanna McGibbons. And so, what were you saying? So, who? Um, Scott Hancock jumped in. Is that what yeah, you said? Yeah, chips in. Yeah, he chips in. Yeah, and I, I chipped in as well. But he, he, he chipped Let's in. Let's see. Is it quite Maybe I'm looking at the other. Oh, wait, just one second. Oh, there we go. So, uh, one of the uh, contributors said, should have waited for KK. Which I don't know what KK. Okay, to be available, she was the only good part of class. And the next one is I watched very little of class when it was out, but I fully heartedly agree. So uh, Scott Hancock said that uh, responded just to say we worked well in advance to work around people's schedule, but it was cast. It, but it was cast actively. Er, er, uh, it's cast actively declined a return. Our hands are tied. It was e either a case of recast or to c can two sets of stories. And so then somebody said, did Catherine and Vivian both say that they didn't want to return or were they were just busy? And so Scott replied, if we hadn't, let's see, let me just get this down. If we hadn't been led to expect a decline, we wouldn't have featured the characters. We work a lot with busy actors, so nothing to do with scheduling, as we can always pick people up separately. But I can't discuss individual cases, just that the response was disappointing. But Dervia and Joanna are fitting replacements. And so then it was a lot of double negatives there. <laughs> nice to have mm. some transparency for the fans, though. Must be frustrating to have to shelve stories which were written in good faith. And so Scott Hancock replied, Ha! I'm on a rare holiday, so was typing quickly. But yes, disappointing to lose people who were previously keen. But it, it's the, a choice between telling good stories with good recast or scrapping stories we'd rather find... or. or Scrapping stories, we rather find uh, we'd rather find a way of telling them. Mm. And I think that's the last Scott Hancock appears in 
yeah there because i mean you know that that is interesting but a shame I and mean, uh... e- even though he- scott hancock didn't dump on the two actresses that you know basically t- spurn them or whatever i do appreciate the transparency i yes. i uh, I mean, you know, there's no reason to dump on them there. I mean, you know, maybe they might have a change of heart or something like that later on in line. Maybe, you know, voice acting isn't what they want to do. And, you know, we we all have our niches in life and we all like and dislike different things. So but I do appreciate that. He's just like, yeah, they, you know, without saying they rejected uh, coming back. He said they rejected coming back, and yeah. you, you that it has to be commended, because I think mm. other companies would just be like, oh well, you know, we tried, or we'd be like, you know, differences of interest or whatever. You know exactly. What I mean? like, like, like they'd be a bit less. I mean, and <clears throat> uh, I mean, and, and that's the thing. Again, it's it's like um, apparently Christopher Eccleston was recently interviewed at a convention. Um, and they, you know, people asked, about, you know, and people w- w- was asking him about Big Finish, and he actually said, "Yeah, they've approached me. I am interested, but I will not be doing Doctor Who immediately." Hmm. Okay. So well, that's interesting. Touch wood, hopefully. Um, because obviously, you know, uh, during that time when he was doing Doctor Who, it was such a, you know, bad time for him, you know, mental health wise. Yeah. I guess it's a lot of bad memories. Oh, oh, so I hopefully, get, oh, if if I if um you know yeah. if uh, if he enjoys his his time at Big Finish doing some you know something else, it mm. might then be more of a thing for them to hit for him then to do Doctor Who. I mean, look exactly. at Matthew Waterhouse for example. You know, he didn't want to come back to Doctor Who, and you know, they got him for Dark Shadows, and he you know he bloody loved it. And then that's well, how they got, got back him back to Dark for Shadows. Doctor Who. And and then he did a box set, which I found great because it began kind of the Fifth Doctor and Adric's companionship. And mm. then the last one was just before Earthshock, Earth which Shock. I'm mm. like, you know what? If that's all we get of Matthew Waterhouse, that, th- that box set, those two stories were mm. worth it. And then yeah. I believe, you know, it was con- I think it was also continued working with Dark Shadows and Big Finish. Mm. And that experience, being back with Janet Fielding and Sarah Sutton and Peter Davidson, basically kind of had him wanting more, which yeah. is great. So he's hoping, you know, Eccleston comes to Big Finish and... and well, yeah, I think once he realises that it's, you know, a nice atmosphere, because the work for Big Finish is probably way less pressure than the TV work. Yeah. Oh, God. And... You know, once he's dipped his toe in, so to speak, and given it a shot, he might find it's more for him. Mm, let's hope so. Yeah. So, yeah, and the other bit of news that the Big Finish have announced uh, is a new IPA, which is Time Slip, which is a, a 1970s kids show. But no. apparently, uh, Brett, there's an interesting podcast that, that, that Craig put me onto. Hi, Craig. Mm-hmm. That... Uh, <laughs> Is called uh, British Invaders, and it apparently mm. goes through. And we we've got way more science fiction and fantasy pro, um, TV programs than than even I realised. They're on like episode three hundred and something, and each episode <sighs> features a different sci-fi show or fantasy show that that's been done in Britain. Or you mm. know, that's by, cr- by that's British. pretty cool. So, um. Real quickly, I just barely I wanted to see what this was, so I, I turned to time scales just to see what Doctor Who fans thought of a couple of uh, the episodes that we will be reviewing in next month or for the month of December when we do the year-end review. And I'm absolutely gutted, but this goes back to our conversation that we had on the phone last week or the other night or whenever it was. The ultimate evil out of ten. Would you like to guess what? At least five, the average of what five fans said. Uh, I want to say four. Mm-hmm. Ooh, three point six is the average. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a bit low. Okay. So mm-hmm. it is as big of a stink. Like mm-hmm. I, I sit and I've looked at that book on my bookshelf for years. I, I bought, picked that up because I never thought. That you know, what is it, R. A. Daly or whatever his name, Tim Daly, Daly. Or, yeah, that he'd ever 
allow it to be because they they tried years ago during the first run of and he declined so i just picked it up and i looked at it like should i should i read that should i read that and then i was so excited so excited for this to come out and then to see that it got a 3.6 that's that's Mm. sad well it's like i said to uh to you on the phone and and, you know because because Kyle was was here when I when I had them on, you know, both lost stories. Mm-hmm. It was like, yeah, they were okay, they were average, but they were nothing to write home about. And it's true, they are kind of averagey. They're not great. I mean, they, they are, are of the time. Funny. Yeah. And so, what like do you I think, Kyle? You know, I, I listened to them and I said, hmm, well, I can see why they lost. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what what do you think Nightmare Country got? Uh. What? Four and a half. Oh, no. 6.3. Oh, okay. Well, Kyle actually liked that one better, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Um, th- th- This really has me excited to actually listen to this uh, early adventure story. Daughter of the Gods. What do you think the 11 fans that gave a review of that gave it? 9.3? Yeah, I'd say. Wow. That. You are so close. 9.1. Oh. Wow. Okay. It is a very good what story. Ho- what about the home guard? How, how did that go down? Let's see. Uh, the home guard got 7.4. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird one. I must admit, I, I, I will say this for the home guard. I love the music. I love the fact mm. that they, they hearken back to the Delgado master music. You know, whenever he starts mm. trying to hypnotize somebody. Oh, they did that. They do, yeah. It's really Awesome. Good. Really, mm. It's really cool. It's, it's not the same thing, obviously, but it's it's like, it's like oh my god, that's so recognizable. Similar. And, that was, and that, was, that was a really nice touch. I did really like that. That was, mm. that was quite cool. Yeah. I, I, I know we're, we're talking, uh, we're going to do this review next month, but I have a quick question that I'd like to ask both of you. So regarding the Eighth Doctor box sets, we have the Time War, we have uh, Dark Eyes, Ravenous, and Doom Coalition. What order would you put these in? Oh, God. Um, For me, it would probably be Doom Coalition, uh, Ravenous, uh, Dark Eye, and this is from the top, so best first. Okay. Uh, Doom Coalition, Ravenous, Dark Eyes, and Time War. So Doom Coalition is f- number one, and yes. Time War is number four? Okay. Yeah. What would you do, Liam? I would say Ravenous, Time War, Doom Coalition, and Dark Eyes. Okay. Because I would put, it, for my order, I would put first... Time War, even though we're not done with it, I would put that first. Mm. I would put Doom Coalition second, Dark Eyes third, and I would put Ravenous fourth. Mm. And I, 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 I'm, I'm just curious. And, and I, when I po- decided to pose this question to you uh, about three hours ago before we started uh, recording, I was sitting there looking at it at dark or not dark eyes at ravenous and i sat and thought i didn't really enjoy this box set but then when i went back and tried to look at the titles and all the other stories i've forgotten a lot about this box set so is it is number four because i've forgotten a lot or is it number four because that's where it deserves its place and Mm. Because I, I, one of my favorite things, and I feel as though I am vindicated for my thoughts on the Derek Jacoby Master, is I do not like him in the War Master box set because everybody is up for grabs. Everybody is dead, essentially. Going into it, the first time you meet somebody, they are dead, unless otherwise something else happens otherwise. Everybody is dead. Whereas in this, when he shoots Helen, oh no, no, Livchenka, yeah. when he shoots her, I was, my mouth dropped open yeah. and I was like, I was like, no. holy cow. Yeah. And then, of course, she doesn't die. And I'm like, 
oh, uh, well, I was speechless, absolutely speechless <laughs> that yeah. she didn't die. And mm. then well, not only that, but she grabbed the gun from him and shot him. And I was just like, <laughs> this, is, this is what he needs. He, yeah, he yeah, has yeah. now become interesting. And here's my other thing regarding Ravenous, because I, I really feel as though Missy has be gone on another level of her own with mm-hmm. Ravenous. I, I feel is I, I to me, this is what Missy is. If we were to look at her in other universes, Missy is Marvel's Deadpool. <laughs> Missy is DC's Harley Quinn. Like there is so much ridiculousness that goes on around her that is funny and is worth constantly like doing more box sets with Michelle Gomez. Yes. She has cemented herself not only in this. I mean, just one second. I, I, I need to play this because this, I laughed out loud so hard because of, let's see, where is it? Well, there we go. That's the deal. I see. Isn't it a little, um, dodgy? Oh, because everything else we do is morally above board. You know what I mean. If they're fine with it, who are we to judge? I don't like it. Of course you don't. None of us do. I'm not asking you to like it. I'm asking you to do it. And I have to? If you want any future at all. Very well. I say bring it on. <laughs> oh, oh, that's brilliant. I mean, everything sounds amazing in that voice. Can, can you just... Can you just keep talking? You know, just random words, anything. I'm rapidly losing my patience with you. Like that, yes. I mean, it's even better when you're angry. Do um, oregano or or aluminum. Please, there's at least a degree of urgency here. All right, Gooseberry. You're just jealous because you sound posh. I'm not jealous. I. We must locate Artron. Artron? Well, well, if it'll make you happy. What the... She's gone. We could all have used that manipulator. We're still stranded. Is it too late to find someone else? Ta-da! Mr. Artron. Yes. Not dead, only resting. No, I've done that joke before, but it's a new audience. You found him. And you won't believe the trouble I had. It took ages. I had to kidnap one of the doctor's companions to help out. Just miss killing her, too. It was really... Oh, it was disappointing. Which companion? Oh, you know, she's she's got eyes and hair and a, and a face and everything. You know that one. Well, whatever you did, you brought us exactly what we required. Most impressive. Well, thank you. So what now? We speak to the Eleven. I, I, I love that. I absolutely... <laughs> I, I, yes. I love the banter between her and the Eric Roberts master. Oh, no. I, I, the... Yeah. And, like, it's... Like, she is on a different level. I mean... Again, with Marvel, you have the Deadpool stuff that is ridiculous and funny. With DC, you have the Harley stuff, which is ridiculous and funny. And with Missy, you can have the same thing. I, I would love for some sort of just and the Missy box set works. And it then does. when I you mean, te- when, I, I was so surprised at, at that box set. I was just like, I want more of this stuff, you know. Yeah, she is on like her own level because not only can, is she can she get like I guess you could say murdery, but she also <laughs> is so funny, which I never thought she would be from the TV series. No, which again proves everybody's theory that Big Finish can save practically anything. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'm gonna say this: Big Finish was around in 1912. They would have saved the Titanic. From sink. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. At la- last podcast, I said Big Finish could cure cancer. They can all. They could have also saved the Titanic. So <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> so on to our book review of Resurrection of the Daleks. This was written by Eric Sayward, narrated by Ter- Terry Malloy, with uh, voices by Nicholas Brigg as the Daleks. Uh, just but go, going into it, um, th- there was some criticisms about this book before it was even released, or or shortly after it got released. And 
do you think that the criticisms for it just being an average Doctor Who story, do you think that was deserved? Um, in some respects, yes. It's not an amazing story. It's certainly not a bad story, but it's not, you know, if you compare it to something like Genesis of the Daleks, it's quite, it's, it's very weak. There are sort of, there are elements that they could have expanded on a lot more, which would have made it, like the whole humans being made into Daleks, it's hinted at, but not really talked about much. And which is, which is interesting because mm. I rewatched the part of the TV series where that was discussed and it never happened in the TV series. No, I think it's oh. done as a precursor to Revelation. Yes. Go Saywood for like, you know, like bigging himself up in his own book. I know that that was my takeaway, Liam. I'm glad that you <laughs> came came to the same. <laughs> oh, yeah, for me it was, you know, I'd I'd re listen to it. It wasn't bad, but it was average. It wasn't brilliant. It wasn't terrible. It, I'm glad to finally read the novel because mm -hmm. you know now I actually understand the story a great deal better. But there are Doctor Who stories I would. I'd rather listen to in all honesty and definitely better Dalek stories the, the the first thing that I really took away with was I appreciated the detailed and uh, sometimes when he talked about the book I uh, or front or part of the story I really liked what he did like when it started off at the very beginning I really like it how it gave a lot of the historical elements of the um, mm. the, the Tim's warehouse where the, yes. the, the majority of the story took place in. High above the road, crisscrossing between the various structures, were several iron bridges, once used for moving goods between buildings. Much damaged by neglect, these bridges now seem to cling to the warehouse walls like frail fingers desperate to maintain a grip on some sort of reality. Once busy with the clatter of horses' hooves and the echo of many languages, the Shad Thames of 1984 was now devoid of all sound and activity, except that of torrential rain. Yes, I did like that. That was cool. The next <laughs> clip I'd like to play is how you could definitely tell that I think the BBC, as well as the script writers and editors, were kind of getting a push to kind of get like a little... Star Warsy, because when I started listening to this, I'm like, I think this is kind of uh, up the Star Wars alley. Somewhere in the sector known as the Hyperion Delta Zone 4, yeah. an enormous battle cruiser hung motionless in space. Except for a shaft of white light emanating from a high point on the ship's superstructure, the cruiser was in darkness. Although the beam appeared to be little more than an overbright navigation lamp, its real purpose was far more dangerous. Much like a laser beam, the it's finger not. of light was designed to cut through the enormity <laughs> of space until, at a prearranged point, gravity would take over and force the light to spiral and twist its way through the cracks and fissures in the time-space continuum. As pressure built and the light became more compressed, the contracting beam was transmogrified into the swirling mass of a time corridor. With one end connected to the cruiser docked in Earth, calendar year 4590, and the other to the warehouse at Chad Thames in 1984, travel between the two points in time was possible. In spite of the battlecruiser's mighty presence, a board ship was very different, small and compact. The interior had been divided into surprisingly tight... See, I like that. Not only does it good, mm. do a good job of establishing certain things, but it get, I feel as though it was never really established in the TV series no. how this was possible, what is going on. Mm -hmm. All it is is that the, the Doctor's flying the TARDIS and he gets disrupted because a time corridor has yeah. opened up. Mm. Yeah. So I appreciate the... I guess you could say the background and further explanation of that in the story. I was almost waiting for the, you know, 
that's the moon, <laughs> that's a space station kind of thing. <laughs> but it never happened, so well, never mind. <laughs> but yeah, Damn it's, it, Morty. It's, oh. To be fair, <laughs> it is, you know, that is one thing I have to say. It is a very well written novel. Yes. Yeah. I, I also, so my, the next cut is I really liked the introduction of Lytton. And I feel as though, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, because when they interview, introduce Lytton and we know what happens to him in Attack of the Cybermen, I would almost be interested in Big Finish. And I would, because he's like a, a creation of Eric Sayward, there, mm-hmm. he'd be earning money off of this. And that would annoy me to no extent, because I feel as though Eric Sayward really never cared about the show ever. He just saw it as a paycheck where as though compared to Terrence Dix, I felt as though, even though Terrence Dix understood that the show was a little bit silly and odd, you could definitely tell Terrence Dix loved the show. Oh dear. Mm. Lytton. I know that one ah. coming from 2023. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, they probably won't do it if they're closing a couple things and kind of consolidating mm. lots of things. So <clears throat> true. But it doesn't mean that they couldn't like put him in main range stories or something. So, but I do like the introduction to Linton. As the airlock door slowly slid open, the two troopers snapped to attention. Standing in the time chamber, surrounded by the bodies of those killed in Shad Thames, was the police inspector. In reality. The inspector was a military commander called Gustav Litton. See, I, I, I just love the introduction to the character. And I've mm. never known his first name. And so th- th- just like th- that whole German thing just kind of makes him a l- sound a little bit more imposing, a little bit more doomish or something like that. So I, yeah. I really like the that attention to detail. I don't know if in the original series he actually had a, na- a first name, but... And then I'll play this part, and then I'll, I'd will i love to get your opinions on uh, a reference. In one corner, her feet resting on the fascia of an enormous radio transceiver, was Ensign Fabian Osborne. In touch with the whole facility, including the patrolling starfighters, Osborne was the ears of the unit. Sharp and intelligent, she spent much of her time translating terileptal poetry into Northern Hemisphere Earth English the preferred language of all true poets. In another part of the room, lounging in front of the deep space scanner, was senior ensign Baz Seaton. Seeming to spend endless hours staring blankly at the machine before him, it was difficult to appreciate precisely what he was registering. To some of the crew, he was considered one of the dimmest people aboard. That was until a recent computer glitch had mistakenly caused the crew's personnel files to be published. This revealed, much to some people's irritation, that Seaton not only had the highest IQ of the crew, but also had a PhD in astrophysics and another entitled Dark Matter Contra the Time-Space Continuum. To make things even worse, Seaton was also an inspired cook, and his pop-up dinner parties were now famous. I, I, I enjoy that kind of attention to detail, but one of the <clears> things <throat> that uh, there is uh, an interview that uh, Gary Russell did and they, they, he was talking about his book, Scales of Injustice. And he made a reference. He's like, well, I was a young writer at then. And one of the things that he did is he overdeveloped characters that would eventually die. And right there, he did a lot of interesting things of developing characters. But in a couple of tracks later, when we kind of meet them after the invasion, they all die. And it, like mm. I, I, as I was, I, I, so I was keeping. For some reason, as I listened to that part, I was just like, w- w- "Why do we care?" I, yeah. I understand, you know, the, the uh, you know, somebody will die, and there is like you know, human tra- tragedy in that whole death. But to go to that far of extent to kind of build their character, only to have them being eradicated short time later, I found just kind of silly. But I like the references to the Terraleptals because it was Eric Sayward who wrote the visitation, so I can see so why. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that was the first reference of to the Terraleptals, and I enjoyed it. 
I was sitting there thinking, oh, t- nice job. You know, you know what? T- t- you, you did write this, that the Terleptal story. Good job for you. And then it got brought up again. And then it got brought up again. I think there was like four or five Terleptal references throughout this book. And I sat there thinking, like, well, he also did, um, oh, did he? No, he didn't do Black Orchid. He did he the, did um, did, yeah, he did Earthshock. I think he did the Awakening also. Mm. And it's just like, well, where is your other shout outs? And yes. I, to me, one thing that kind of annoyed me about the constant reference to the Terleptals was, are you trying to like work your way into using them either? And I know this is not a big finished production, but getting that name out there enough, are you trying to either say that you're going to be developing a Terleptal storyline or because you've now kind of included them into writing poetry and some other things that they did within this story. Are you trying yeah. to make them relevant to the point where, you know, big finish being like, oddly, after we, we got through listening to resurrection, of the Daleks, we, 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 for some reason, we, we, we have this idea of terraleptals. Could we use them? We will pay <laughs> yeah. money for this. <laughs> see, like I said to you before, I still want to see a, a you know, a, a root and Sontaran war box set, you know, how that all kicked off. Um, oh, that'd be great. I, I'm all mm. for that. I mean, now they, they they would have to get two estates involved. You'd have to get the yeah. um, you'd have to get the Terrence Dix estate, and then you would have to get um, what's his face? Um, Robert Holmes. Robert yes, Holmes. Robert Holmes. Yeah, and 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 also I, uh, I you know, um, my friend Johnny wants to see the uh, Quark Empire box set. Huh. <laughs> off of the uh, off of the comic book that they kind of use the quarks in, or no, 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 what? no, just from the Dominators. Oh. He 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 wants oh. to see the sort of you know the Dominator you know Quark Empire box set. It's quite funny. I don't know because I do that. think actually I do think actually that they they should bring them back. I think they are a overdue monster to be brought back and expanded mm. upon. They are, but I think the best way that they could do that, and I have not read the comics in which they appear, but I believe they would have to do some sort of comic adaptation, bringing them back. I I would be more for that than like a talking eagle that they did with the the Tom Baker thing that I just found. What? Just talking talking eagle. Yeah, Uh, in the Tom Baker talking eagle. What you? Oh, you mean from that Roman story? Yes. Yeah. Huh. I mean, I, 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 that would be more uh, interesting for me. And I feel as though, you know, because the Quarks were an actual entity in Classic Who, they made a, a run in, uh, according to a couple people, they made a better run in the comics version because they were able to be drawn out a little bit more. If you're going to do something with the Quarks, why don't you establish something that was already in continuity, bring it to the public's perception, because not that many people probably are aware of that storyline, and then you can go forward with other stories with the quarks. That's what I would think. Mm. But ah, You never know. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. Next, yeah. I don't have this track labeled, so I don't know what this Knowing is they had to get away and to maximize their cover, Mercer and Stiles crawled back to the control room on their hands and knees. It's over, said Mercer. We can't fight this. And he was right. So what can we do, asked Stiles. You won't like this, he said tentatively. But the station has a self-destruct system. It also has a bathroom, snapped Stiles. So what's your point? Mercer paused. (laughs) Well, he said, we could operate the self-destruct. Stiles wasn't impressed. Can't we use a bath instead? No water. I, I think I remember why I decided to cut that part is because I appreciated the the dire circumstance that they're in. The Daleks have boarded their ship. They're being slowly eradicated. And, you know, obviously they're crawling on their hands and knees, fending for their lives. And at least Eric Sayward takes a moment to make a comedic jest 
yes. about what's go- mm. what one of their al- al- alternatives this could be. I appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That is yeah. good. I'm, like, I'm do, do you think it was just because of the storytelling of the time where something like that, even if it was in the script, would have been uh, rejected? Or do you think... <clears throat> Because it, the way that they told stories back at the time, it would not even be conceivable to write such detail. Um, Sayward is quite a detailed writer, because if you read his novelization of The Twin Dilemma, it's equally detailed. Uh, so, And that was written back in the 80s. So um, I think it's simply just, obviously it's only just been written, so... Hmm. But I think it would have been very light that had he written it in, back in 1985 or whenever it was. So is The Twin Dilemma a better oh, book better than it than is serial. a story? Yeah, way better. One of these days, I, I know you, you gave me the challenge of listening to Ark in Space. And as much as I enjoyed, I, uh, what's his face, who read it? John um, Colshaw. Yeah, John Colshaw. I hate that story so much i i could only get through a disc and a half and i was just like it is as interesting as it was as better as it was i just i hate that story Uh. (laughs) so i i i would you know what maybe if i find myself with some free time i might give the twin the twin dilemma audio a listen because because it is known for to be a dreadful TV show, hmm. but hmm. perhaps Eric Sayward could save the book, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right. Hmm. So this one I do have. So I, I like that. So this one is when I realized that part of the book's continuity is uh, diverging or is d- going in a different direction from the actual TV series. Because in the actual TV series, you have a couple people that are sent down to where they, they're keeping Davros, and their their main goal is to destroy the prisoner because the Daleks want him. And you have two people that are slowly, uh, that are trying to get to him because he's stuck in a freezer and then the Daleks bust in. Actually, before the Daleks bust in, one of the guys who is trying to help, you know, get the the storage door open, uh, he start, you know, the, he starts stinking. And the the female lady is just like, "What's that smell?" And he'd been exposed to some sort of like mustard ish gas earlier on when the Daleks invaded before he left. Well, it took a little while for the mustard gas to kind of take effect. But it slowly started eating him and deteriorating him and melting him. And mm. he died that way. Compared to how the way Eric Sayward wrote him in this story. Apart from a scanner screen, a console, and an ancient-looking life support system, the walls were ugly, bare, and grimy. In the middle of the area was a long, transparent container in which the prisoner, bolted to an upright frame, was sealed. For ninety years he'd been held in confinement, unwashed, unseen, unvisited, and certainly unloved. Neither did it help the well-being of the prisoner that, by now, almost everyone he had known would doubtless be dead. Osborne stared into the container, full of iced mist. It remained impossible to see anything inside. "'What if there isn't anyone in there?' she said. Seaton quickly solved the problem by ramming his screwdriver into the drain plug and releasing the contents. Instead of returning the tool to his pocket, he offered it to Osborne. It's yours, he said. Osborne, who had recognised the screwdriver, accepted it. Why did you need to steal my tools? The sabotage airlock three. The Daleks want the prisoner. But why involve you? Seaton shrugged. I suppose they checked me out, saw my position in the facility. Seaton had started to perspire, which was very unusual for him. I mean, two PhDs, yet no proper prospects of advancement. They assumed me to be a seething mess of resentment. Osborne was annoyed. You didn't have to work for them, she said. You could have moved on, rather than killing your friends and fellow crew members. Seaton shook his head. Daleks pay very well. They even offered me eternal life. 
you know. Make me a Dalek, Osborne scowled. Cold and brutal, that sounds just like you. That's a bit harsh. Seaton pressed the button on his laser that turned it from stun to kill. I mean, I'm actually sorry about this. I was really beginning to like you. Suddenly a beam of white light leapt the space between Osborne and Seaton's weapon. A moment later, the girl, with a beautiful smile and impressive skill at chess, fell to the floor, dead. So, I, I appreciate the, I guess you could say, the liberties that Eric Sayward took with his own work, where he established this, this good relationship, only to have this person be extremely cold and, you know, kill the person that they're mm -hmm. supposed to do this thing with. But at the same time... I feel as though, and then I, I rewatched it last night, I feel as though the par part where this guy basically starts melting because of the mustard gas that he was exposed to or whatever it was called is, to me, more horrific than, you know, he. this guy also eventually gets gunned down by the Daleks. It, it, just, it, it ends similarly with both of them being dead. But in this way, it's, it takes one bit of ho horror and changes it for another bit of horror. And I feel as though it was done better where he was exposed to this thing and it was slowly mm. eating at him compared to him just being like a saboteur. Yeah. yeah. And what a random phrase, skillet chest. Like... <laughs> skillet yeah, chest. See, it's like, uh, well, well, apparently not because uh, uh, this is checkmate, buddy. Bam, you're dead. That's that's oh. what, That's what he should have said. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> skill at chest. Sorry, I thought it, I thought it said skillet chest. Oh no! I was like, what? I was like, what? A random? Why? Why focus in on on her? Well, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's not that. You you can't be skilled at that. You're either developed or you get enhancements because of uh, <laughs> not. But you 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 can't be skilled unless you were a doctor that did perform those procedures. You can't be skilled at that. Ah, uh. <laughs> uh, all right. So this is where I was listening and nearly swerved mm. out the road laughing because this actually depicts what Turlo was doing the entire time when we were watching the Resurrection of the Daleks audio focus. Neither were things going well for Turlo. He was lost. Not properly lost, as he would say, just a bit lost. More like misdirected. It certainly hadn't helped that patrols of troopers kept passing by at the wrong time, forcing him to hide, leaving him disorientated. Neither was it useful that Turlow had forgotten the compass given to him by the doctor. Then there were the wretched Daleks gliding around like so many demented pepper pots. It was like having all the school bullies crammed into one class. Arriving at yet another door, Turlow turned the handle. Nothing. All he needed was somewhere to hide, to rest before he got himself captured or killed. Headspace that might help him find the time corridor so that he could make the journey back to Earth. So that's what so Turlo was, was doing. <laughs> exactly. Was that's, what he, that's what he was doing for most of the thing. Uh. Just, one of the things that I found odd that he took uh, liberties in is the, the Dalek Supreme actually saw him like cowering and hiding in corridors and then just decided, you know what? Let's just let him just like do this. This we'll, we'll, we'll round him up and kill him later. I, I thought yeah. that was like the most bizarre thing ever. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, one of the dogs is like, look, a do uh, look, a companion of the doctor and the doc and the Dalek Supremes is like, yes, I know he's there. Let's just leave him there. We'll kill eh, him later. Eh, eh. <laughs> uh, which I, I to me it seemed it, that sounded so undalek like it's, i mean i i understand that the, the dalek supreme was a little bit smarter than everybody else but just to i just to acknowledge something and be like you know just s send one dalek and get it uh, get the job done no no yeah. we'll, we'll 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 let him think that he's hi hiding even though we can see him that's just mm -hmm. so bizarre the one thing I didn't like is when oh, what's what's the guy's name? I forgot his name. The guy um, that was a Dalek replicant that he would stutter and then oh, he'd Stein. stop. Stein. 
So Stein is loose in the TARDIS. And Eric Sayward, I don't know how many pages this consisted of, but this consisted um, of like three tracks of him just describing the TARDIS and the Doctor's persona and, oh, look, there's this. And then, ooh, on Fridays, the Doctor likes to do this. And it's just... It was a renegade of its type, much like the Time Lord, and was as quirky and unpredictable as its owner. There was no end to its interior. It was an infinite, edgeless space that allowed for all possibilities and, for that matter, improbabilities. The Doctor relished in maximising its potential, its character, its personality. So, should Stein have ventured through that console room door, he would have been astounded, overwhelmed and flabbergasted. There were endless corridors and stairways that didn't so much lead as draw and entice you into rooms, chambers, halls, auditoriums, attic cellars and spaces that were indefinable. These presented surprising experiences and sensations, both good and bad. This was at the heart of what the interior was about. An art gallery was not so much an area to display paintings, sculpture or installations, as a place where you would be immersed into the artwork, gaining a real understanding of the artist, their life, and what fueled their inspiration. This could be a daunting prospect, given the turmoil experienced by some of the Earth artists, such as Caravaggio, Rembrandt, and Van Gogh. But it was always revelatory and at times visceral. It was even rumoured that Michelangelo had used one of the Doctor's artist studios to paint a couple of masterpieces, but that might have been an exaggeration. The Doctor's wardrobe was a huge cavern, lined with several oceans of conflicting garments that came and went. What's the purpose of this? <laughs> exactly, that is rather purposeless. I mean, did he have a page count that you have to get to, like, I don't know how many pages this is, but, you know, do you have to get to 217? Because to me, that's, it's just filler. It's, it is. Yeah, very much. So. I mean, earlier on when we were talking about the establishing characters, that backgrounds that will eventually be dead, that's one thing. But to just have Stein wander through the TARDIS and then just talk about the, the TARDIS interior and how it, you know, uh, some of the pictures changed because, you know, in this incarnation, the Doctor more or less likes Rembrandt. But there is another room somewhere that it mm -hmm. has more of a Leonardo focus. And it's just like, who cares? Who actually cares? Mm. Mm. I, uh, now, here's a question, Humphrey, because I have not read any Dalek books before. Do they... In the other Dalek books that they do, do they do a good job of differentiating between other Daleks? Yes, normally they're pretty good. Do, uh, do, do they do it they like do. Eric? Do they do it like Eric Sayward? Because I, I, I was impressed to some extent. Because uh, I'll play this track for you. The Supreme Dalek Seed. I have dispatched Daleks to complete the task you failed. You must redeem yourself. You must destroy Davros's Daleks. I thought you wanted them alive, said Lytton, that you wanted to avoid more Dalek casualties. The rogue units are no longer contained. They have followed the TARDIS to Earth. Possession of the TARDIS will give Davros an unacceptable advantage. They must be exterminated. And what are the duplicates in the warehouse? said Lytton. They are armed only with primitive human weapons. They will die. Lytton switched off his radio, contemplating the Supreme's reprimand. He knew this was a mission that he might not survive. Hearing of Lytton's mission to Earth and probable death pleased the Alpha Dalek exceedingly. But what pleased it more was its belief that the Supreme Dalek had made an error of judgment. So I, I, I like that, where it kind of establishes what eventually will happen with Lytton, where he's kind of in this kind of argument with the Supreme Dalek. But then you also have this Alpha Dalek. And throughout this book, that's how I, I, it seemed like there's only like really like four Daleks that really existed. You had the Supreme, you had the Alpha, the Beta. Um, I don't know if they had a 
C Dalek, but they had a Delta and an Epsilon Dalek, I believe. Mm. And it and so kinda, that's yeah. how er- I, I, I appreciated that. But to me, it almost sounds like there is like a really distinct beehive qu- uh, quality amongst the Daleks where you have just the worker drones and stuff like that. But hmm. that's more in a line with what I guess you could say Moffat tried to do and what the uh, movies in the 60s did is have D- Daleks in certain lin- – or I guess you could say – yeah, um, pedigrees or something like that yeah, that whereas, specialize in certain things. Yeah, the other yeah. books tend to, uh, you know, obviously have the supreme and whatever, but mostly Daleks are just Daleks. That would be interesting if if Big Finish could could expand upon that actually and do more. Like, <clears throat> I, I really appreciated the bit with um across the Darken City where you have that Dalek and then and then it, and then it becomes the Emperor for um evil of the for Daleks. Evil? Yeah, but um mm. and. But, uh, I I would like to see Big Finish expand upon that and do more of that and like you know not have like an asylum kind of type thing but have like a more a deeper explanation of the different Daleks. Well, not only that, but at least in that audio cut, I mean, the Alpha Dalek was excited that he believed that the Supreme made a mistake. To me, that would almost sound like there could be a mutiny, which would be amazing because right now in this story, you have Davros basically uh, controlling other Daleks, making slowly growing his army. And then if you have like this whole other Dalek mutiny, because the alpha is just like, ah, I think he's making the the Supreme is making some big mistakes or whatever. And that would be so interesting so polarizing because not only would it be two factions, the Imperial Daleks versus the regular ones, but then, you, you know, perhaps just like you said, like across the darkened city, you could have other Daleks, you know, the, the, the alpha Daleks is like, okay, hey, put me in this chemical bath. Th- th- this will make me stronger. This will make mm-hmm. me smarter. This will make me better. And like, uh, you know, ex- like forced self mutation to become more dominant. That would yeah. be interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes. So I'm going to play the second to last track almost in its entirety just because I really like, I, I will say here, before I do that, did I felt as though in the TV series it weighed on Tegan the entire time mm. that all, all this death and all this stuff. And I feel as though in this book, it focused purely on the story, and then at the very end, Tegan was just like, "I, I can't do this anymore." And and the doctor, "What? What do you mean you can't do this anymore?" And she's like, "Oh, it's all the death." And then she leaves, and it, to me, it mm. came out of left field. Whereas yeah. I feel as though they were kind of establishing this, especially when she she was and the other lady were captured by the Dalek replicants in the the Shad Tim's facility. Mm. The click-clack of heels echoed across the cobblestones of Shad Thames. It was Tegan, in a hurry, as always. Having just said she didn't want to travel any more with the Doctor, she had stomped out of his life with the barest of farewells. Tegan remembered muttering something about her Aunt Vanessa not finding life on board the TARDIS fun and how she'd wanted to stay on Earth. That wasn't much of a farewell. Tegan and the Doctor had travelled together for three years, and he deserved a better explanation for her sudden departure. But it was too late. The Time Lord in his TARDIS had gone, probably already on the other side of the universe, involved in yet another escapade, another challenge. Tegan was now confused. Had she made the right decision? There were always adventures, she recalled. Some of them scary, but many of them exuberant, ebullient, and, yes, even fun. There were, after all, the many planets she had visited, the amazing civilizations she had encountered, the sheer exhilaration and wonder of travelling throughout the universe. She would never have had such experiences flying for Air Australia. So why had she been so negative? Tegan's mind was in a swirl. 
Now she was free of the doctor. But where was she precisely in time and space? She knew the year and had a vague idea of the day and months, but how would she fit back into the system? Tegan began to panic. Would she have been missed? Would the police have been informed of her absence? How would she explain her whereabouts for the last three years? Did she still have somewhere to live? So many questions. Anyway, I'll stop right there. I, I, I love the Tegan thoughts. Yes. As she's departing the doctor. I found that beautiful. I also love that she was being stalked by the Dalek replicants that still survived. And then there, to me, there was a tease near the very end where it, I was waiting for Eric Sayward for her. And I talked to Liam off uh, in a phone call whenever we did that, where I'm like, yeah, I, I'm almost anticipating Eric Sayward's new series Tegan Javanka, Dalek Replicant Killer. Because <laughs> to me, that's what they almost started to tease at the very end of this book. That she, her, her adventures with the Doctor are done, but she can still do something. Hmm. And mm. I, I prefer to think of that, Tegan, compared to where we meet her, was it The Gathering? Yeah, The Gathering. Yes. I, I, I felt bad for that, Tegan. I mean, granted, I believe that that Tegan had cancer, right? Yes. Yeah. But I, I I like the hopefulness that Eric Sayward left Tegan with, yes. and also the the possibility of I mean, can, can you just imagine Tegan, no one to complain to, going around trying to help people also? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she she would just be like you know, muttering complaints to herself too. Yeah. Or or she meets up with Ace, uh, and and you know thirty years on, if she's still alive at this point, uh, you know maybe works the charitable Earth alongside Ace, and you know and you know they could you know before Ace does char you know charitable Earth, you know she could sort of impart some you know Ace Dalek Hunter kind of mm. stuff. I know, I, I'd be uh, for I, that. I can see that. Yeah. Um. So I guess final thoughts on the resurrection of the Daleks. Well, for me, it's you know, it's a good story. As I say, it's average, but it's a good story, and the book is way better than the serial. Um, but I did enjoy it, and I'd probably rate it. I would say probably a seven. Okay. What about you, Liam? I didn't actually get around to listening to it, unfortunately. Oh. Um, but um, yeah. So. I. A hundred percent agree with you. I would give it a seven out of ten. That that's exactly what I was thinking while we were listening. Because th there are some aspects of this that are really good. Mm. There's some unnecessary things, and like I said, the constant references to the Terleptals was almost like, "Hey, I did this too." Um, if anybody's listening, I could write a book about this, but. Yeah. I do enjoy the I did enjoy this story. Was it the best story? No. Was it actually better than the TV series? Yes, I think it is. Where would where do you where would you put that, Humphrey? Yeah, I would definitely say it's better than the TV serial. I mean, when me and Liam did the audio focus, I going into the audio focus, I thought a highly of the TV serial. And then we did it. And I was like, because I, I, I put this up with um, uh, what uh, Caves of Androzani and <clears throat> Earthshock. It, to me, it was those were the best three f Fifth Doctor stories. And then after we did the audio focus, I came to the conclusion that it is not top three. Uh, no, no. I mean, isn't. maybe it'd be top 15 somewhere. Yeah, mm. but not top three. Not in mm. top three. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed it and, um, you know, listen to it, listen to, I, 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 I was, was, what did you think of Terry Malloy's da Davros? I mean, in none of the audio clips did I have any of Davros's, uh, clips, but what did you think? Did you think it was, 
uh, appropriately yeah. screamy like Terry Malloy does, or do you think it was kind of jarring, Humphrey? I thought he did a good job, to be honest. It was slightly different to how it's done in the television series, but then it's going to be it's 30 years on or something silly, you know. But I think he, he did it very well. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I mean, to me, Terry. I mean, to me, Terry Malloy is the definitive Davros. I mean, yeah. Would in the classic series, would I like him to have like toned down the screaminess because the other two Davroses could get screamy to, from time to time? But mm. Malloy, I guess, really went all in. To me, I guess the only issue I had was whenever uh, Nick Briggs would do a Dalek voice or whatever. I, it, to me, it seemed separate in sounding compared yeah, to how the. Yeah, I was going to say that. Like it, it took a while for them to, you know, for, like, you know, Malloy to read again. It's mm. like, uh, yeah, that, that's the better. that's the sound design issue. In other novels, it's not so pronounced. Yeah, that was a bit. I was like, oh, that's a bit rubbish. <laughs> well, I mean, I I've listened to I think what is it Dalek Generation and like. I believe that is also read by Nick Briggs. It is. Mm. And even though he can kind of pause and do stuff or whatever, I didn't feel as though there was much difference in between him, Nick Briggs, reading it mm. and then doing the Dalek voice. Whereas uh, with this one, I feel as though Terry Malloy read it and there, there was like a slight pause mm. and then the the Dalek voice insinuated where... Yeah. And, and then maybe pause maybe again it's, and then... Mm. I mean, granted, when Terry Malloy did the Dalek, uh, the, the Davros voice, he did it almost in step. But that would, I, I can't imagine them, uh, they'd have to stop recording and like either use a filter or change the filter on the computer. I don't think that they could just do it where he's just reading it and then he immediately goes into the Davros voice. So there has to be some editing. So perhaps oh, yeah. it's the yeah, editing definitely. of... Yeah. This that yeah, I'd say that. Yeah. All right. Well. All right. Then. With that, we got a seven and a seven and a maybe listen to it on an airplane flight to America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, All right. Well, with that, that is the conclusion of this episode, episode number one hundred sixteen of the Doctor Lember podcast. It was, uh Doing post-production on this, I could not believe how long it actually took. This was quite long, and FYI, I did some more cutting in between the sessions. I will not put all of the, that what I cut on the very tail end, just so I wanted to give you a taste of some of the uh, witty or odd things that we do just as we dis uh, work on maybe creating just a bonus uh, Patreon uh, sounds from the podcast. So... With that being said, thank you for listening. And uh, again, whatever you, whichever uh, platform you listen to the podcast on, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, uh, Pod Directory, uh, Stitcher, TuneIn, whatever it is, Podbeam, I think we're still on. Um, give us a five star review. It helps get us uh, no our notoriety out so that we can be, uh, I guess, highlighted more so that more people can find us, so that more traffic can come to the podcast because it, you know, if you enjoy the podcast uh, maybe somebody else who doesn't know about it might enjoy the podcast so again uh, five star review if you could or feel so ob obligated to uh, no no guilt trip involved whatsoever and some possible kind words we'd appreciate that and uh, would read them on a future podcast so thank you for listening and downloading and we will see you in time you have been listening to the doctor who alambra podcast Doctor Who is owned and trademarked by the BBC. Doctor Who Alambra is not affiliated with the BBC or Big Finish. No infringement is intended. Visit our website at alambrapodcast.weebly.com or email the show at alambraaudio at gmail.com. Tweet us at alambrapodcast. That is a-L-H-A-M-B-R-A -A podcast. Thank you. Um, I've just thought of a bit of a, an idea for the reviews, guys, simply because okay. um, I've got to be up early tomorrow morning. Um, okay. I've got voluntary work. So I thought if we do 
um, resurrection tonight. And then what we could do next podcast, because we're doing this big review anyway, is we can be slightly more detailed from September onwards. And then it will just be all one big, you know, because we won't be doing so much news and stuff in the next one, will yeah. will we, unless we have no. breaking mm. breaking news. I just thought it would actually make me... Cause breaking news, the 13th Doctor marries a Dalek. <laughs> well yeah that would be breaking news <laughs> oh, but, I now I just... take you <laughs> From will behind. you be mine <laughs> oh Dalek you are so sexy oh don't do that again <laughs> <laughs> my, Sorry, my vision know. is impaired I cannot see <laughs> oh doctor you are so fit <laughs> <laughs> is that your eye stalker are you just happy to see me <laughs> see me uh. <laughs> i say um no i just no that's uh yeah i just thought but also yeah. we'd kind of be rehashing what we'd already said whereas obviously that is true. if we mm. because i know we've reviewed like august and july and stuff but also by next week as well you know we're going to have had you know more thoughts of, you know we may have more, more to to some drama well. I mean, and... I'm, i've caught up and stuff but i know you guys obviously haven't caught up on everything yeah yes. i've got a few more I bits to yeah. listen better, to actually. yeah so, <coughs> no that um, that's, that's a great cool. idea yeah, works. yeah uh, and then, then we can but we can okay. I, I thought if we do resurrection tonight and then we can do our big mm. finish uh yeah. yeah we can just do it all on the 14th okay all right then yeah. um other big right. news so